better find out what the date is before I call to order. <laughs> Hi, good evening and welcome to the August 29th, 2016 School Committee. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. I know there's a big crowd of people who had a long day and a long day coming up tomorrow and a really, really big day coming up on Wednesday. So really excited to meet you all. Um, I think I will, at this point, turn it over to Dr. Doherty to introduce us to the new staff that are joining the Reading Schools this year. Thank you. We are very excited um, to introduce all of our new teachers this evening for you. Um, last week, uh, they all came together and were part of a week-long induction program uh, where they learned a lot about Reading and the culture and um, some of the things that we believe in and the direction that we want to go. Um, I want to thank, uh, before I turn it over to our building principals, I want to thank our building principals for all of the time and effort that they put in this summer um, in the interview process um, to, to hire the best candidates possible. I want to thank our interim HR administrator, Jen Bovey, who's right there, um, for, for, for processing all of the information. Um, seems like it's been an ongoing uh, process for, for several weeks now and I want to thank her for all her hard work um, as well as as well as our entire central office staff for their efforts. So I'm going to start first by turning it over to uh, Principal at Barrows, Heather Leonard, um, just as for logistical reasons for our cameras and newspapers is that the, we're going to have the principal on this side of the table near the microphone and if the people that get introduced if they could form a line behind uh, her and that would be great. Um, and then I'm going to let Heather do all the talking for her Barrow staff. Thank Barrow you, Dr. Staff. Doherty. Thank you, Sharon, and school committee members. We appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to celebrate the exciting new energy and new folks that are joining our district. I have two new folks that are joining the Barrow School community. Um, one is an individual named Dan Tulevine. He's actually going to be shared between Barrows and Eaton. Dan is our new music teacher. Um, Dan graduated from Berkeley College of Music with his degree in um, music business. And after spending some time in a cubicle, as he decided, feeling less than inspired, he realized his true passion was in the area of sharing music and sharing his love for music. So he went back to Boston Conservatory and got his Master's of Education in Music. And so we are so excited to have Dan joining us. He's actually celebrating his anniversary this evening with his wife. So we wish them a wonderful anniversary mm -hmm. and Dan, we look forward to Dan joining our community. Um, this is Patricia Flaherty. Patricia Flaherty, I am excited to share, is going to be our new reading specialist at Barra's Elementary School. Patricia is coming to us from Salem. She graduated from Salem State and she spent, we said, 15 years mm -hmm. teaching fourth and fifth grade um, and decided to pursue her passion in literacy and went back and got her certificate to become um, a reading specialist and is entering her sixth year as a reading specialist. So we're so lucky to have Patricia joining us at the Barrows Elementary School. Um, she and her husband live in Georgetown and she has a cat cleverly named Spider, so I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, so we're excited to welcome Trisha and Dan, and again, thank you for the opportunity to celebrate our new staff yes, in the district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. I'm going to now call up the uh, principal of Birch Meadow, Julia Hendricks. I do want to give a short introduction for Julia as she's coming up here. Um, Julia has been in public education for 22 years. Uh, she's been a classroom teacher in both the Cambridge and the Carlisle Public Schools. Um, she also, at the Lexington Public Schools, where she was her previous role before being principal here, she was a math coach and an assistant principal. Um, she has a Bachelor of Arts from Wellesley College, um, and a Master's from the Harvard Divinity School, and a Master's also from Lesley University. And she is originally from South Carolina, but has lived in New England for 37 years. And she um, actually is much happier with winters here than summers in the south. <laughs> so um, I introduce you now to Julia, and she's going to introduce her staff. So if I come. Okay. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> 
Uh, good evening, I'm Julia Hendricks. It's nice to meet you all. These are the new staff members at Birch Meadows School. And I, um, I'm gonna try to do it in order you're standing in, even though I have it organized on my sheet in order of grades. So I hope I give everybody the right introduction. Um, Beth Orzano is joining us as a kindergarten special education co-teacher in the Connections program. And she has her undergraduate degree from Providence College and a Master of Science in Early Childhood from Adelphi University. And for the past two years, she has been an inclusion assistant at the Horace Mann School in Newton in a co-taught classroom. And then Tammy Merzicki is joining Birch Meadow as a fourth grade teacher this year. She has a master's in education from Lesley University and her bachelor's from Fitchburg State. She spent last year as a math interventionist in the Bill Ricca Public Schools. And before that, she taught third, fourth grade in the Shrewsbury Public Schools for eight years. Then we have Heather Sullivan. Heather is a third grade regular education teacher at Birch Meadow. She has a bachelor's degree from Stonehill College and her master of education from Salem State. And then she has been in Reading working as a long-term substitute at Wood End and Killam Schools. And she also has experience in ABA. Then we have Melissa Kirby, who is a fourth grade teacher at Birch Meadow. She is the regular education teacher in our co-taught connections classroom, has a bachelor's degree from UMass Amherst and is getting her master's in education, um, focusing in STEM education at Framingham State. And she has been working in the Ashland Public Schools as a teaching assistant in a sub-separate autism program and as an assistant teacher in a fourth grade classroom. Paula Falvey, who is our new library technology specialist, and she has her bachelor's degree from Salem State and her master's from Plymouth State, and for the past six years, six years, has worked in the Medford Public Schools as a library paraeducator and a technology teacher. Then we have Olivia Romano, who is a second grade special education co-teacher in our Connections program. And Olivia has a bachelor's from Providence College and her master's from Salem State. And she has substitute taught in the Reading Public Schools and has experience in inclusion classrooms. And I'm standing in front of Catherine Breen, who is our fourth grade special education co-teacher in the Connections program. So she's actually sharing a classroom with Melissa Kirby. And Catherine has her bachelor's from, oh, I got it, Sacred Heart University, <laughs> her master's from Lesley University, and she worked for three years at the Horace Mann School in Newton in co-taught classrooms in third and fourth grade. So thank you very much, and join me in welcoming them to the Reading Public Schools. Awesome. Thank you, Julia. I would like now uh, Sarah Mashad from Coolidge Middle School to come forward and introduce our staff. Our staff. Good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to be here tonight with two of our three new teachers. First, I would like to introduce you to Krista Roy. She is joining us as part of our new Connections program, newly named Connections program. Um, our used to be Developmental Learning Center. She'll be one of the two teachers in that program. And she comes to us from Breck Breckenridge, Colorado, where she got her undergraduate degree at the University of Colorado. Denver. Oh, University of Denver, I have it even written here. And then she completed a master's degree at Lesley University, where she's then been teaching in the Cambridge Public Schools and joins us freshly from the Cambridge Public Schools. So thank you and welcome, Krista. And I would also like to introduce Jessica Shanick. Um, Jessica is joining us in our therapeutic support program as the one teacher in that program. She earned her undergraduate degree at the University of New Hampshire in the field of math education. She then started as a um, paraprofessional where she fell in love with special education and decided to go back and get her master's in special education and she went to Cambridge College and while there she also worked as a teaching assistant at SEAM which is part of our collaborative here and then after getting her master's she worked at SEAM for four years and we are happy to have her experience joining our program and which is great and we are missing tonight Pauline Sutsis who is a recent hire in our school for eighth grade ELA on our team Pegasus team. Pauline 
has been it's just joined us who she was also teaching in the Boston schools at a math and science public school charter of a public school so and she was teaching ninth grade and is now going to be teaching eighth grade with us this year so we look forward to having all three women on board and we love having them around already they've added, already have added so much so and thank you for having us thank tonight you. Thank you. I'd like uh, Eric Sprung to come forward with the Joshua Eaton team. Thank you, it was a great start to our day. Um, we thank you to, to Jean and the superintendent for starting off the school year with our district-wide meeting. Uh, and then we had a great meeting with the staff today. And then these two wonderful ladies who were hired just this summer hadn't had a chance to meet their classes. So they actually held open houses today in their classrooms so parents could come uh, and their students could come and meet the teacher and see the classroom. So it was a, it was a great opportunity that they provided for uh, the students today. So we'll start with Caroline Boucher. Uh, so I'm happy to have Caroline with us. She is gonna be teaching in our bridge program. And she has an undergraduate degree from Bridgewater State in education and cultural anthropology and is working on her master's degree at American International College. She has a variety of experiences uh, working with special education students in North Andover and as well as in Lexington and actually has worked in Reading Public Schools at Barrows doing some tutoring work. And so we're happy to bring her back to Reading and we love having resi Reading residents as part of our school system. So welcome to Caroline as part of our school system and welcome, welcome back. <laughs> uh, Kelly McQuillan, who's going to be teaching first grade with us this year. So Kelly has an undergraduate degree uh, from UNH as well as a master's degree at UNH. Her undergraduate uh, was in women's studies and a master's degree in elementary education. Um, we took her away from Peabody Public Schools where she taught third and fourth, fourth grade for two years uh, and she's excited to make the transition to first grade and had some really great connections with the students and families today. So happy to introduce these two new faces to Joshua Eden. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I would like to introduce the uh, new Kilmer principal, Sarah Lejack. She could come forward with her staff while they're coming forward. I'm going to introduce uh, Sarah. Sarah has an undergraduate degree in child development and a Master of Arts in Teaching from Tufts University. She also has a literacy certificate from Boston University. She was previously employed in the Lexington Public Schools, uh, both as a first grade teacher and a third grade teacher. She, while in Lexington, served on numerous committees and in various capacities such as a district data manager, a mentor, a literacy tax, and on the literacy tax force. Um, she's presented locally and nationally, and she is a curriculum developer for the Tufts <coughs> University Rabo First Grade Literacy Intervention Program, and she is thrilled to be a member of the <laughs> Killam community. True. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Marissa Bada. She is joining our therapeutic support program as a social worker, a much needed and um, desired spot in our school. Um, Marissa comes to us from uh, the Everett Public Schools where she has been for the previous six years as a social worker. Prior to that, she uh, spent six years in a um, hospital setting uh, as a case manager where she found her love for her students there. Uh, she has her master's from Boston College and her undergraduate degree from Endicott in psychology and criminal justice, so we might tap into her for that sometime too, we'll have to see. Uh, but we are thrilled to have Marissa on our team and uh, excited to start the school year, so thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like now uh, the new Parker principal, Michelle Shanklin, to come forward with her staff. Um, as a coming forward, just a little bit about Rochelle. Um, she has spent 16 of her 20 years in Linfield as a grade seven, eight math teacher, a math department head, and an assistant principal. Prior to Linfield, uh, she taught grade seven and eight math in Arizona and Long Island, New York. Her degrees are from Arizona State, where she has an undergraduate degree in secondary ed mathematics. Stony Brook University, where she also has a master's, and Salem State University, where she has a master's in educational leadership. Thank you for the opportunity. We're really excited about our new Parker staff. So we'll start off um, Amy Betancourt. Um, she is a special education teacher in our grade seven learning center and bridge program. She comes to us with 
27 years in special education, most recently in Salem, and she has a very varied background in reading programs. So welcome, Amy. Um, we have Jen, Jennifer Blackman. She's our new sixth grade math teacher. And out of college, Jennifer worked in finance using her MBA, then realized that that was not fulfilling her dreams. She went back to school um, to get her master's in education at Leslie. And she's coming to us with eight years experience from both Florence and the Boston Public Schools. So welcome, Jennifer. We have Arielle Wazdenko. She's our new school psychologist. And she received her undergraduate degree from Providence College and recently completed her master's in school psychology from Northeastern. And she's coming with internship, internship experience from Brookline. So welcome, Arielle. And we have um, Ariana Seligman. She's our new phys our physical education teacher. She received her master's from Salem State and her undergrad from the University of Tampa. And she taught phys ed in Drake for the last two years. So welcome, Ariana. And we have Jessica Dougherty. She is actually not new to Parker. She worked in Parker last year as a one-year substitute for grade six English. She is now back this year to teach seventh grade English um, and has become a respected member of the faculty. So although she's not new, she um, has done a fantastic <laughs> job in the English department and program for our students. So welcome. So join me in welcoming them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Adam Bacher, principal of Ray Moore High School, and his staff. You see us a <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having us. It's always an exciting time of year introducing our new staff, and uh, we're very lucky to have a talented group of educators joining us at the high school this year. Uh, I'd like to first start off by introducing Cameron Brown. Uh, he's actually returning to Reading Memorial High School as a chemistry science teacher with 15 years of teaching experience all over the world. Uh, Cameron earned his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Bates College. He holds a master's in teaching from Tufts University and is a doctoral can candidate in math and science education at UMass Lowell and is uh, going to be looking to do his dissertation uh, at the high school. We'll be talking about that soon. So. <laughs> Um, I'd like to then introduce Marissa Weigel. She's our new speech and language pathologist at the high school. She attended Smith College where she majored in clinical psychology, then got her master's degree in speech language pathology at BU. Uh, there she completed several internships, including an internship at Framingham High School. Wellesley, she also worked at Wellesley Preschool and, uh, in Brighton, and then most recently at the Sil Silver Hill Horace Mann Charter School up in Haverhill. So we're happy to have her. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Eileen Messenger. Uh, she's going to be working on our Crossroads program this year. She received a Bachelor of Arts in Writing, Literature, and Publishing from Emerson College and a Master of Science in Education from Bay Path University. Uh, before coming to Reading, she worked in the Malden school system and before that at a private day school for students on the autism spectrum. Next, I would like to introduce Tim McIntyre also a former Reading resident and graduate of RMHS. Well, very happy to have him here. He's returning also for his second time to teach chemistry. <laughs> so this is a, a favorite place for us, and you guys <laughs> just can't leave us. <laughs> uh, he attended UMass Amherst for undergraduate and UMass Lowell for his master's degree, uh, and then taught at RMHS for, from 2006 until 2008. Then moved to Illinois and taught for eight years in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, before moving back to Massachusetts this summer, and we're happy to have him here. Uh, next, I would like to introduce our newest assistant principal, Jess Terrio. She's joining us as assistant principal, and prior to this, she was the guidance director in Revere, uh, and also the vice principal in Revere before that, and then before that, she was the guidance counselor in Peabody uh, at the middle school level. During her pre-educated career, Jess spent time in the business sector and also in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, she's currently a second lieutenant, pilot, and disaster preparedness officer uh, for the Civil Air Patrol out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, so you may occasionally see her in the skies. <laughs> and, and, or uh, running out of here in a flight suit. <laughs> Don't be <alarmed>. true. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, I'd like to introduce Jacqueline Callahan, uh, who is our health and chemical education teacher now here at RMHS. She comes to us from Ford Middle School in Akushnet, where she taught health for the past 10 years. And uh, you know, she's very enthusiastic about sports 
in health, including snowboarding, rock climbing, surfing, and yoga. So you can join the several educators at the high school who uh, participate in yoga. So you're certainly joining a rich bunch of us in that area. So thank you very much to everybody, and uh, we're really excited to have them this year. Thank you. I could have uh, Joanne King come forward. Wood end in her staff. Good evening. Thank you for having us, bringing up the rear of the Reading Public Schools. Um, after checking her references and being told that she's absolutely amazing and I would never find a more dedicated or talented teacher, I had to hire Stacy Forsman. <laughs> <laughs> so Stacy Forsman is going to be our um, half-day kindergarten teacher at Wood End, and we're very excited to have her. So she comes for, to us from the Lincoln Public School. She actually worked at the elementary school on Hanscom Air Force Base, and um, was a kindergarten teacher there. She received her bachelor's from James Madison University in Virginia, so she's a Southern girl at heart, and her master's from UMass Lowell. She comes to us with 13 years experience um, teaching kindergarten and first grade, and um, she actually had the opportunity to study abroad in Paris, which I thought was really interesting. Her junior year of college, she was able to travel, and she didn't speak much French herself, but was able to travel to many countries and enjoy the challenges of living with a host family that actually didn't know much English. So <laughs> I'm sure the communication was great. <laughs> but we're very excited to have Stacy join us as part of our kindergarten team. Um, Maggie George here um, is actually related to us. Um, her sister, Courtney Poirier, was amazing, is, is an amazing fourth grade, I shouldn't say was, is an amazing fourth grade teacher um, and taught at Wood End for several years before taking a leave of absence to raise her boys and referred her sister to <laughs> us. Um, and after interviewing her, we were just thrilled to have her. Um, Maggie's joining us as the teacher of our Compass program, our integrated learning program for students with severe special needs. And she actually comes to us, um, she has a bachelor's she received her bachelor's from Bridgewater State University and completed her, she's completing her master's program this year, so hoping to be done in May, which will be exciting for her. And she's certified in severe special needs. She has three years experience working with the North Shore Educational Consortium. And in her spare time, you should know this, she makes extravagant cakes and cupcakes. <laughs> so we are very excited to have Maggie <laughs> and Stacy joining the Woodhead team. So if you could join me in welcoming them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I do have two district level administrators I'd like to introduce to the school committee and the community. I'm going to reintroduce Jennifer Bovey. Um, who is actually in her fourth year working with the Reading Public Schools. She started um, in the district as a special education paraeducator at the high school, and she's also worked at the, in the extended day program. Um, she has an undergraduate degree in psychology from Plymouth State, and she is currently pursuing her master's in human resources management at Salem State University. So, um, and as I mentioned, she has uh, hit the ground running with all of the different hirings that have been happening uh, this year. So we welcome Jen. Um, I would also like to introduce for the first time Gail Dowd, who is our Director of Finance. You, you all met Gail during the interview process. Um, Gail has her Bachelor of Science in Accounting and Finance from the University of Lowell and a Master's in Business Administration from Suffolk University Sawyer School of Management. She is a licensed CPA. Um, her career has been spent working in private corporate sector in Boston, including the positions at Ernest & Young, Investors Bank & Trust, and lastly, Eaton Vance. Um, career has focused on all aspects of finance and accounting, including reporting, budgeting, forecasting, internal controls, and accounting. Um, and she is also a volunteer for the audit committee, for, uh, as an audit committee chair at the American History Textile Museum. So we certainly welcome, she's been in her roll for three days and <laughs> says it's like drinking out of a fire hose. <laughs> um, and I believe Carolyn Wilson will be introducing one yeah. last, last administrator. Last I'm going to introduce Kelly Zicato. Um, Kelly has been in the district for a number of years. She was a student teaching at Killam 
and then went on to teach at Barrows and Birch Meadow in our Compass program. And now she will be a team chair and administrator for us at Barrows and Killam. So we're very excited to have Kelly in that position uh, for this school year. Thank Great. You. Welcome. Is she a group? Wow, I, I just, I don't need to tell you how impressive those qualifications were. It was just one impressive resume after another. So you said, um, Dr. Doherty, to thank the principals, but yeah, no doubt, you did a great job. So thank you for all the work that that must have taken to bring such talented and experienced people to our district. Um, and to Jennifer, obviously, you've been busy. So good job. Just a little. Just a little. Um, I had the opportunity today, Dr. Doherty, um, led a wonderful kickoff meeting. I hope you were as inspired by it as I was. Um, but if you took nothing away, I had the opportunity to speak to the group. Um, you know, teaching, this is all very exciting, but you're going to close the classroom door. It's just going to be you and your kids. And just please don't forget that we're all here, that all the parents, the entire community, we're right outside the door of your building supporting you and encouraging you and really cheering you on. So just never forget that this community is very supportive of our public schools and of you and your profession. So thank you for all that you have done and that you're going to do for our kids this year. We're profoundly grateful. So have a great year. And yes, I believe the the newspapers would like to take some photographs by school, so I believe. So why don't we make it a five? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Oh, what? So everyone's so, excused. So everyone's all set. We're going to take a two-minute recess for anyone who doesn't want to stick around for the next two hours. It's riveting. <laughs> <laughs>
is cleared, I will call the August 29th school committee meeting back to order. Um, through my excellent management of the meeting, we are 30 minutes out of schedule. Um, so um, we will go into public comment. So uh, if there's anyone here tonight who would like to address the committee on a topic that isn't on our agenda, um, namely the superintendent's evaluation and continued discussion of the FY18 budget, I would invite you to address the committee now. Yeah, go ahead, Mrs. Downing. If you could just state your name for the record. Mary Ann Downing, 13 Heather Drive. This is for a question. The new Sparkling Medical website does not include any of the archived school committee information for the date the website came up other than the budget document. Is there a plan to move oh, anyone just Mary, to I'm so sorry. Push it. Yeah. Push. I think a little further Push. from you. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Honey. Uh, I can repeat the question. That it's would be great. It is just is for the new Redeker website. Will is there a plan to port the archived information prior to July for, for the school committee, such as the past year's minutes and packets and whatnot, over to that? Because right now they're not. You can still get at the old headline site. The main Reading Public Schools headline page redirects you, but the sub pages like school committee, human resources, those still work. Right, right, right. So I'm just wondering if you all have, a, have someone de designated to do that. It's a great question. Yes, um, we do have a plan. We knew that the website that you see is uh, functioning, but it's not complete. And you know, the, the backup, all of the historical information, that's gonna take some time to get on there. So it's going it's to take time. Okay, as long as we don't we don't have a timeline. We will we're going to chip away at it. We felt headline was ending, and I know it's still the page is still up, but we no longer subscribe to headline, so we can't use it anymore. Um, so we are we are now fully in the Radiker page, um, and we're going to do everything we can to keep chipping away at the information that was there before. Who who's doing it? Is it the district doing it or the Radiker uh, people? You're looking doing at it? us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the get director some, of technology. Get some high school students. In yeah, and get, get it done. Okay, but thank you. It, thank you for that question. It's a very good question. So ultimately, old um, I shouldn't say old historical agendas packets will be on the Redica website yes. for school committee. Yeah. Okay, and in the meantime, for the gap that exists from right now, I want to look at past stuff to whenever it's complete. Presumably, someone can contact the district Absolutely. office and say, "I need to look at old information and access it that way." Yes. Okay. Thank I, you for that. Thank question. you. Um, that's a good Any other public comment tonight? Okay. Seeing none, um, we are going to go to the consent agenda, which I believe is just the approval of two minutes tonight. Is that correct? I don't think there's anything else. Mm -hmm. Straightforward. May I have a motion? Yes. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Before I hear a second, I was supposed to ask, did anyone want to remove anything? All right. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of the consent agenda as presented? Good. <laughs> Was that you, Mr. Nine? Well, yeah, yeah, he's five there. Five zero. Thank you. Dr. Doherty, I understand you have some, um, actually, before I turn this over to you, because I think your reports are pretty lengthy this evening, mm -hmm. you're going to let us know what you've been doing all summer. Um, before I turn that over, does anyone on the committee have any committee reports? No, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Mrs. I just want to say that um, we had the monthly meeting of RACASA. Uh, oh, Dr. Doherty was there also, and Mr. Zaya. And yeah, school people, our school, our SRO. Yes. Uh, Have some removal over there. And it was actually an amazing update from Erica. There's just you know so much uh, going on in terms of um, some good collaborative work with other communities, uh, some grant activity. Uh, so I would highly recommend that people take a look at the Rakasa website, which is in its new location on the Redica uh, platform now. And uh, the annual meeting is coming up in September, so take a look at that. I don't have the date right here, but we need to get that September meeting on the calendar. And we've got, do you remember the name of the new film? The, the, new, the new film that we're showing? Oh, no, I don't. Um, 
We it's saw it shown just, twice. Oh, it's going to be shown twice. We saw a clip of it. It's going to be shown at the annual meeting, and then there's another showing, um, highly recommended for uh, parents of uh, really middle school, high school, um, even the sort of older elementary. And uh, the other thing that was sort of exciting is they introduced, and this may be just for the whole community, we do the um, uh, you know uh, unused medication collection, and we've done a great job with that as a community. But there's a, uh, I should have brought it with me, basically an, a new technology that allows you to dispose of it in your home. So it's a package, and the, all the packaging ends up being completely biodegradable. But you can put the medication right in this package um, with it. It has a chemical, and you add water to that, and it will completely dissolve the medication. So for people, you know, maybe it's elderly people or people who can't get to the um, medication drop, but you want to you know, destroy the 30 extra Vicodin your doctor pre prescribed you that you don't need. Um, it's a great uh, package. So I know that she's got a few hundred of them that they're going to have available at the police station. And what's the name of the, the bedroom called? The, um, uh, oh, um. shoot, anybody from Lacasa. They're going to set up in uh, the month of October. What's it called? No, Basically, called they're setting up it would be like a high school kid's bedroom in plain sight. In plain sight, yep. And it, it basically, you can, it will be open to parents to come in and tour and take a look at, and you'll be able to go through it and not believe all of the things that are in there that are related to um, maybe some types of chemical abuse uh, or abuse or abuse issue. And the, it's called Hidden in Plain Sight because it's, it's plain objects that are not plain objects. And uh, so that's going to be set up, and the community will get an ability to tour that for, I think, two or three days in October. And um, were you going to say the Fall Street Fair? No. Yes. Okay, go ahead. All right, that was it. Okay. <laughs> um, a couple of very quick things. So one is that the Human Relations Advisory Committee is, our meeting is changed for next week because we didn't want to conflict with this Thursday, September 1st meeting which is the financial forum. We thought it was important that we encourage everybody to go to that. So instead, the Human Relations Advisory Committee is going to meet in town hall in the conference room on Wednesday, that's September 7th. Um, so, and that will be posted soon. So you will see the agenda for that. Um, and we will be talking about the Martin Luther King Day event. So if you have ideas, please come. We're excited about some of the things we're, we're talking about, and we'd love your ideas. Um, the CPAC has been busy at work all summer. Um, I don't actually remember the meeting, but I don't know if you came prepared with that. That's, okay. But there's going to be a meeting coming up, and stay tuned and check out their website on Redeker. To be, to be kind. Yeah. Not quite there yet. Yeah, it's not there yet. Um, and um, the third thing out of four, is that the Metco Reading Pool Party and Barbecue, which it will be our ninth annual one, is held at the Doxer House, my house. Um, and we are hoping that having it after school starts will enable children to talk about the event and bring their friends so that families can meet each other and start bonding so that play dates and parties and everything will get easier um, as the school goes on, and we're going to be kicking off the Friends of Metco program, a new approach to the idea of host families, and so we really would love for folks to come to learn more about that. Um, and that is Saturday, the 10th of September, which is the day before the town fair um, at the town fair. Let's try to lead into it. At the town fair, um, the Human Relations Advisory Committee will have a tent there, a booth there whatever you call it, and Ricasa as well. It's an awesome take in this town. You really feel the warmth and the energy of our community that way. And that's my segue, actually, into just two sentences about what I experienced this morning at the initial um, meeting of the teachers. Um, Mrs. Borowski mentioned it, but I walked into that room, and the energy and the excitement was palpable. And it, I really felt so proud to be a part of this school district. 
Um, and then listening to Eric Goldstein, who is the um, president of the Reading Teachers Association and what he had to say, which connected local with state initiatives and the need for all of us to be very aware of what's going on and um, where our funds could go in question two, um, talking about charter schools. Very important to be aware of what's going on. And then our chairs talk about what she mentioned now, um, which is really how important the teachers are in touching our youth. Um, that's what's gonna make a difference long term. It's really important, the academic skills, and it's really important and memorable, the relationships they make with teachers and teachers knowing who they are. Um, and Dr. Doherty combined all that with both personal and academic and long-term vision, promising no more, no unnecessary initiatives, not unnecessary, no new um, unexpected initiatives, um, for which he got applause. Um, and then also um, introducing some really personal aspects to the job of teaching, wrapping up with a video that was straight from the mouths of parents and kids about the impact teachers have had on them, which I think is really important for our teachers to hear given the pressure of the accountability that is put on them all the time and it gives them a license for the other piece, that personal piece of accountability, which is how they touch our students and they know now from three of our uh, administrators that um, the way they touch our students in that way, emotionally, socially, personally, is also really important and very valued. Thank you, that was more than two sentences. You took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> that was two sentences? Sorry, right. we got loads no of No punctuation. Time yeah, lots Run of commas. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Draxer. That was a, it was a lovely meeting. It was an absolutely lovely meeting and um, wonderful way to kick off the school year. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I will share with the committee that Mrs. Webb and I attended the selectman's meeting a couple weeks ago. Thank you. Um, I don't think anyone in this room, it will not be news to any of you, but um, we did attend the meeting and the Board of Selectmen did vote to put forward an override question in October. Um, October 18th, there will be a special election here in the community. There will be a ballot question for a proposition two and a half operational budget override. The total amount they voted was $7.5 million. Um, a chunk of that money is, is not going to be used right away. Um, it's going to be set aside and the idea is to make this sustainable because as it was explained, the, um, the problem we have is growth of expenses. So if we just raise the budget to a certain level, in FY19, we'd be in a structural deficit again. So what we have to do is, is say to the community, we think this override is going to last some period of time. And the way to do that is to put some money aside. Um, what that means for the school committee, if an override is to pass, we will be looking at an increase of $2,960,000 beginning in FY18. Um, and we believe that that will be a sustainable ongoing for 8 to 10 years at about a 3.5% increase every year. Um, if the voters approve it. So um, we'll be talking more about that this evening, but there are a couple important dates to remember. Um, October 18th, there will be a special election. If you're a registered voter in Reading, you definitely need to get out and vote on that day um, uh, on the topic of the operational override. And um, much more soon, this Thursday, September 1st, that is Thursday night, there's a financial forum right here at the Reading Memorial High School in the Performing Arts Center at 7.30 p.m. Um, absolutely critical for anybody who, who's interested in understanding more than that very high level overview I just gave. Really important to come in here, the selectmen speak, the finance committee, the town manager, Dr. Doherty, um, all the interested uh, parties to this topic to learn more about um, how the override is being proposed and what it will include. Yes. Oh, one more date is the um, special town, town meeting. meeting on September yep. 12th. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, special so, town meeting on September 12th. And I believe uh, one of the subjects there, well, is the um, senior tax. So, yeah, it, well, there's yeah. eight articles. Mm -hmm. um, I believe three or four of them deal with tax policy. Yep. Um, article 8 is the last article that, that's an override discussion. Town meeting doesn't have a formal role in deciding an override, mm -hmm. um, but um, there will be a, dis it's, it's like an um, uh, informational article. So we, I, I think the point there is to encourage um, community members to attend that meeting and um, give an opportunity, you know, uh, um, even behind the checkers you have an opportunity to, uh, to speak up and weigh in. 
and uh, the warrants I know are available at town hall right now that's a very good point. Um, it, you are, people sometimes think that if you're not a member of town meeting, you can't speak at town meeting. Um, the moderator often, it's up to the discretion of the moderator, but he often will allow non-town meeting members to speak after town meeting members have debated and discussed. So certainly non-town meeting members should feel free to attend and ask for permission to speak. Yes. I was just gonna say another tech, another way is also to speak to your town meeting members yeah. beforehand. Yeah. Write them letters, write us letters. And if you don't know uh, who that is, it's a phone call to town hall. Get the list of your representatives. That's a great point, Dr. Dr. Um, anything else from the committee this evening? Usually, um, we will have student representatives here, but they are probably enjoying their last 24, 48 hours of summer vacation. So um, I can't wait to hear from them. It's really fun to hear what's going on when school starts from the student perspective. Dr. Doherty, let's hear from you. So I've got several pieces tonight that we're going to present for you. Um, I do have an extensive piece that I want to talk to you about uh, with the lead in water uh, as you know we've been working on that all summer but we do have some members from the facility department and the Reading water department that are coming at 8 o'clock um, so I'm going to hold that piece um, until they come um, but I am going to we are uh, as a group we're going to talk about different areas I'm going to talk about what's been going on from a facility standpoint this summer uh, there's been a lot of work happening in our buildings um, talk a little bit about what our district leadership team has been doing. Craig will talk about some of the learning and teaching uh, activities that have been going on. Carol will talk about student services and um, I'll follow back and, and hit a few other items. Um, so let's, I want to first talk about the facilities piece. Um, so first of all, all the schools, if we were to start school today, we're ready to go. Uh, our custodians um, in our maintenance department did an amazing job. Um, they had essentially 71 days from the last day of school on June 21st until uh, this Wednesday to make sure that everything was, all the classrooms were empty, clean, dusted, um, waxed, um, stripped and waxed, uh, as well as the, the rest of the building. And that is with everything else that's going on in our buildings. We have uh, programs in several of our schools. We have the recreation department, extended day, special education programs. So there's a lot going on in our facilities and maintenance and custodian staff did an incredible job. So in addition to the cleaning, um, there was a lot of preventative maintenance going on, which is something that is normally done this time of year uh, with boilers and our um, HVAC equipment. Um, all of our fire safety, uh, the fire department has been through, the building inspector has been through to take a look at all that. So we've had all of our state inspections. All of that has now been um, completed. Um, we had uh, several projects going on this summer. Each of the buildings had four to five uh, classrooms painted. Uh, we were able to, to get some painting done. Um, the Eaton Cafeteria and Gym got painted. The Barrows Cafeteria got painted. Um, and all of the stairways and cafeteria at Reading Memorial High School. If you get a moment uh, at some point, go into the cafeteria at Reading yeah. Memorial High School. Um, we were able, uh, our food service director, Krista Morello, was able to um, secure uh, a grant um, for someone to come in and to really make it look more of a student-centered type cafeteria um, with red and black and logos, uh, rocket logos, and, and different uh, places that you would go uh, in, the, in the cafeteria to eat. So it looks really, it looks really neat um, if you get a chance to go down there. Uh, all of our gym, wooden gym floors got refurnished. Uh, we usually do this on an annual basis. Um, as you know, they get a lot of wear and tear during the year with not only our students, but with our outside groups. And then we had several other completed projects going on. Um, we had roof repairs at Barrows, chimney work, soffit work. Birch Meadow, we also had some chimney work done. Um, our library at Barrows got reconfigured. It was Connected to uh, how we, as if you remember uh, in the July meeting, I talked about how we had to uh, restructure a classroom, have an additional special education classroom. So we had to do some reconfiguration in our library and our computer lab to make that happen. Um, and we had some faucet replacement, as, as we're going to talk about in a minute. Joshua Eaton, um, we received uh, a grant through RMLD uh, to do a complete LED light conversion. Um, so when you walk into Josh Reed now, it is a much brighter, all of the hallways and corridors, much brighter environment um, and much more energy efficient environment. 
New fire alarm system came in at Josh Eaton as well. Killam, uh, we had a reconfigured computer lab. I don't know if you remember when you walk into Killam's library, it's a huge open space. Um, and we had the computers when you walk in on the right. And to create a much better learning environment for the students that are, were using the computers, we now have created a classroom. So there's an actual walled classroom that has now been built in that area um, for those students. So it's a much better learning environment um, for the students that are using the computer lab. Uh, Killam also had some extensive faucet replacement, which we'll get into a little bit in a minute. Um, at Wood End, there is an outdoor classroom being put together, which has been funded by the PTO. Um, our DPW is working with our facilities department to create that outdoor classroom. It's located in the back of the building. Um, did some roof work and some exterior door work. Coolidge also had some faucet replacement, and uh, we also, as you approved, a new cleaning contract, so that group has started not only there but at the high school. Um, Parker, we had a new carpet put in in the Banning Chorus Room, uh, which had a lot of wear and tear. Um, Reading Memorial High School is very happy, especially on the fourth floor, because we uh, were able to, through uh, support of the PTO, put in 12, cla 12 classrooms of ceiling fans to make that fourth floor a lot cooler. Um, it's not air conditioning, but it still gets that air circulating in this much better environment. It also was a lot of sidewalk replacement work done around the high school this summer. Um, I do see that our uh, two experts in water are here. So um, we'll, we can start with the water piece if you want to, maybe if you want to come over in this area and we can. We have Kevin Kabuzi here, who's the Assistant Director of Facilities, and Eric, I always mess up your name. Uh, Miss Lickie, thank you, from the Reading Water Department. Um, I do again want to say that um, the uh, collaboration with the Water Department, the Facilities Department, School Department, um, has, has been amazing this summer in this uh, pretty serious issue, uh, an issue that Reading is not alone in dealing with. Um, we're learning more and more that, and we now you're more aware of it, you see it in the newspapers. There's a lot of school districts that have schools that are dealing with the issue of lead in water and how you address it. Um, and Eric has been instrumental as the lead person in identifying uh, where, you know, how other school districts have been handling it. Um, and what uh, what we can do about it. So you have in front of you a memo um, which outlines everything that's been done essentially this summer. I'm going to pass this out to the rest of the And if I'm missing anything, please. <laughs> so, um, as you can see from the memo, uh, there has been extensive water testing done since we first recognized um, that there was a problem. As you know, the first round of testing was done in mid-May by our water department. At that time, uh, we had, there was really three schools that were identified as, as having some sources of, of lead, um, Coolidge, Birch Meadow, and Killam. Um, and at the time when we presented to the committee, um, the, the plan was uh, to re remove the faucets of all of, of the affected areas. Um, what the tests were showing is that the initial test was showing the high lead um, above the 15 parts per billion, um, and the 30-second flush was showing um, lower levels, which indicated that potentially the source of the lead could have been the older faucets. So. Um, through the facilities department and the water department, um, pretty much all of the faucets in these schools were replaced that had the high lead content. Um, a second round of water testing was done, um, and we got additional results back. Uh, and the, the results now that I'm referring to are the ones that were done uh, on August 8th, uh, August 8th, 9th timeframe. Um, and what we found is that the removal of the faucets did not solve the problem. So what that means, in some cases it did, but for the most part, especially at Killam, it, it did not. Um, so what that means is we, have, we had to take other, other action. So I'm going to go building by building um, 
just to give you an idea. So Coolidge, as you can see here, was tested on several dates, uh, May 19th, June 1st, June 20th, August 8th, and August 23rd, we just did another round, um, and we have not received those results back yet. Um, repairs in terms of the removal of, of all the faucets was completed by 8-7, August 7th. Um, at Coolidge, we, the, the, the source is primarily um, in the kitchen. There are two kitchen cooking kettles and the staff washroom sink. So the actions that we, we took this summer, um, or the water department and the facilities department took, um, they basically um, addressed all the issues by replacing the faucets. Um, they have closed down the, the shower fixtures because we did see some, some issues there. Um, there is one shower fixture that's going to be um, still available at, in, in, um, at, at Coolidge. Um, showers are not used anymore, really, by our middle school students. Um, and the, fix, the fixture it used is well below the, um, the, the lead limit. Um, I, as I mentioned also earlier um, in a previous meeting, we are now using a threshold of 12 parts per billion instead of 15. Um, that's by our own. We want to be more conservative, so uh, you may see that we've made some changes based on a 12 parts per billion, not necessarily a 15. And we just want to be as, as safe as possible. Um, so a total of seven fixtures are replaced. Um, there's been extensive flushing done. Um, we did retesting. The, the kitchen kettle fixtures were still above the limit. Um, they are fine in the kitchen with the 30-second flush. Um, so right now, the cafeteria workers are being instructed to flush that fixture for 30 seconds before the use. Um, we are taking further samples, um, but we haven't gotten the results back yet. And the kitchen workers' bathroom sink, um, we have now posted as a hand wash only sink not to be used for drinking purposes, which is a common practice that is done in schools that have uh, lead content, uh, higher above level content in, um, in, in, in sinks and bathrooms. Um, if you go to Birch Meadow, similar pattern, uh, there was testing done. Uh, there were five areas that um, were above the lead limit, uh, room 13, room 21, the cafeteria, water fountains, and the teacher's room kitchenette. So similar action was taken. Um, anything that was connected to the faucets in room 13 and room 21, the water fountains, if there were water fountains in those rooms, were, were capped and no longer in use. Uh, we are now putting uh, hand wash only sinks, signs at, at those, in those rooms. Um, the, the water fountains in the cafeteria, what we've done is we're going to cap those or have already capped them and we are putting in Poland Springs dispensers um, in that location as well as we will put one in the teacher's room and also make the teacher's kitchenette sink a hand wash only sink. Um, Killam is the, the biggest concern. Um, we had some isolated areas of Coolidge and Birch Meadow, but Killam, it is very clear that um, this is more of a systemic problem probably due to the age of the building um, and in the piping. And, you know, lead, and I, I, again, if I'm misspeaking, uh, the lead can come from the solder. It can come from the age of the pipes. It can come from the elbows, the brass elbows. Um, I've learned a lot this summer about how lead accumulates in water. Um, and the, the flushing, uh, the 30-second flushing, for the most part, does work. Um, but we still have to take the necessary precautions. So at Killam, you can see there were 34 uh, saucers above the lead limit in all of the rooms that are listed there, uh, pretty much all, all the classrooms, water fountains um, in the hallways, the bathrooms, um, and some of the uh, sink areas in the different work rooms, and uh, the wash areas in the kitchen, but not in the food preparation kitchen parts. Um, so similar what we did, 47 fixtures were replaced this summer at Killam. Um, unfortunately, uh, when we did a second round of testing, the results came back showing similar uh, above level results for those areas. So we are doing something similar at Killam that we, are, we did at the other schools. We are making all of the classrooms, whether they went past the 12 or not, rather than confuse anyone, we're making all of the classrooms hand wash only. Um, we have capped all of the water faucets 
because at Killam they have the combination hand washing and water fountain. Uh, so we've capped all the water fountains. We're no longer using the water fountains in the classrooms. Um, we are not obligated by law to have uh, water fountains in every classroom. Uh, but we have the signs in each classroom that say uh, hand washing only. We have the Poland Springs dispensers um, in several corridors. Um, we have capped the, the water fountains, uh, the old water fountains in the, in the hallways um, and in the different areas. Um, to, to completely change the plumbing would be a significant expense. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, which as you know, with Killam being the age of the building it is, um, it would trigger other things that we would need to do to the building and it would be an extensive amount of funding that would be needed. So other schools, other schools and school districts have gone through a similar and, and this is the, the process that they've used where they've essentially made every sink a hand washing only sink um, and have come in with bottled water dispensers um, throughout the building. So I don't know if I missed anything. Wilmington, by um, Chelsea, by Boston. It's uh, sanctioned by uh, Mass DEP as well as MWRA. It was the course of action to take. Um, and it's it, all those towns I just mentioned, uh, you know, struggled with the same issues. Burr Elementary School in, uh, in Newton is, is of the same era that, um, that Killam is. And they, they went down this whole road and then over the, they, they put a, it was 180 grand to, uh, to redo their, their, uh, their bubblers uh, over the summer. And, and they, uh, they invested you know, that into the school that resolved that. So that's pretty much where we're at right now. With right, so I just want to clarify. So the scenario then for Killam is um, that you'll con we'll continue to have the pool in spring instead of using the bubblers. The classrooms will pretty much from here on out remain as hand wash only. You're not going to, we won't be putting um, bubblers back in there. But right. there is a plan. Will we try to address the bubblers remediating the bubblers to get us off of the Poland Spring if we can do that okay again it's going to be it's going to be a price tag issue um, <clears throat> and I don't know the makeup of the school in Newton was it you said the uh, yeah, Burr Burr elementary, Burr elementary yeah. um, Killam is a little tougher out of the three of course um, to access the plumbing um, it's all block, it's glazed block, cinder block, mm -hmm. so those pipes are run down the block. So it's either break the block open, or we'd have to access the pipe in the ceiling and cut and cap the pipe there and then reroute it, probably exposed on the wall, and tie it back into the bubbler, and in some cases, change the bubbler. And some of the bubblers that kill them are built into the wall. They're built into the block wall. Mm -hmm. so, so the SBA, MSBA is doing a sort of a re-inventory? They're supposed to be coming in this fall to look at all buildings in the Commonwealth again. So I would um, think this is a really important yep. uh, piece to make sure that they're, you know, obviously fully aware of. So, I mean, I know, I know we're talking about that's a long-term issue that we're sort of grappling with or figuring out when we can even begin to grapple with it. Um, but, and what what's the... Do you know like what the cost yet is of the Poland Springs for the... Well, the, Pol the Belmont Springs dispensers that we get are free. So uh -huh. the dispensers are free and I think it was a dollar, dollar something a bottle. It was under, it was under two dollars a the big, the big For ones. the five gallon? Yeah. Yes, for the five and gallon. How many do you need to actually service the school effectively? I'm sorry? How many? Do I think we we've got six. We bought six. Yeah. Uh, how many, how many stations or how many bottles? Station, the stations, yeah. Um, I think we got seven stations for Killam and we figured to start off six bottles for each station. Mm -hmm. So that'll get us through quite a ways. Okay. I, I do want to add one thing that I forgot to add. Um, the, did we include? We did include tests. You'll notice that the module classroom faucets are, show no level uh -huh. of lead, um, which, which really, um, I think, dispels the notion that it's coming from the street. This is, this is a school plumbing issue. Um, it's, it's not a uh, MWRA water, water issue. So uh, the module is a new line right off the... Yeah, the module lines, are, it's probably a 20-year-old line. 
that had been put in there. It's 20 years old. That's uh, that goes out to it, and then uh, we they reattach to it where the previous uh, school was, I believe. The module, the, the old module, there before. Yeah, and it uh, and there's zero uh, content, less than one on on any kind of uh, faucet or water fountain there. Is, is the modular uh, metal, copper pipe or PEX? No, it's copper pipe. Oh, PEX is not allowed in commercial. Oh, in commercial. No, yeah, it has to be all copper. Oh, I learned if that was a solution for the bubblers. I guess not. No, no, no. Okay, darn. We wish. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. So the MSBA, um, as Mrs. Webb said, is doing a re-inventory of schools. Do you, given that this is cropping up across the state, do you have any sense, Dr. Doherty, of whether or not and how seriously lead issues will be taken into account as they inventory the schools? I, I don't know the answer to that. I have not heard anything. Um, that that would be a factor. But given the fact that there seems to be more and more awareness of this, I wouldn't be surprised if MSBA does make it part of their formula. Okay. Yeah, I, I would that as well. Um, we talked about the 12 versus 15, lowering that to be conservative. Is that a state? Is that just local to Reading? Is that state or is that federal? Uh, with the MWRA, when, the, when you have a positive um, uh, hit being like above uh, 15 parts per billion. Uh, they run a secondary test on it. So the, sa the sample remains. Uh, they run a secondary test on a secondary machine and then they, they correlate the two together <clears throat> to see if it is an actual high read just because it's a different line process. In that correlation, <clears throat> there's a 10% margin of error that, uh, that we felt um, we wanted to, uh, to, to bring our tolerance down to 12 because um, <clears throat> if, if we if we drew a cutoff line, which which we did, um, you know, and and even at 15 parts per billion, it's not as strong. Like it's not, it's not um, anything that happened out Midwest at all. It, you know, the, the, those you know uh, in Flint, they, they were hundreds of thousands of parts per billion, or you know, tens of thousands. So, but even in, in just where do we draw the line? And um, and we felt that at uh, at 15 parts per billion, if the test uh, gives a 10% error, that brings it down to you know, 13.5, and then, so 13.5, let's, we're gonna call a line at 12. We just felt it was a safe line to draw. So that's what we, we did so. That makes sense. Mrs. Webb asked about the budget impact. Can I ask about that as well? I'm assuming the bubblers and all of this is gonna fall under the facility's core budget. Is that correct, or does that come out of the school budget? Um, we, we really okay. haven't had we that conversation. That we are, Joe's gonna get me an estimate, Joe Huggins will get me an estimate of what it, could cost. We, we have to give this a couple of weeks to see okay. how much water they're going to go through. Um, and then we can come up with an estimate and figure out, um, you know, where will the source of funding be. We may have to go to the Finance okay. Committee uh, for a reserve fund transfer. Mm -hmm. I would say that this is one of those extraordinary expenses. But it sounds like it's going to be an ongoing annual expense. Uh, right now, yes, yeah. because we would, need, we would need to do extensive work at Killam um to not use bottled water i had one more question mm -hmm. <laughs> um so it sounds like the solution killer makes a lot of sense you move everything to hand wash it go only and you refill your bottle from the pool and springs what i'm concerned about is a change in culture so i feel like in that first few weeks of school everyone goes okay there are new rules in place and everyone that know you notice the signs is there a plan for ongoing kind of retraining of staff and teachers to remind them in october and january uh, don't forget Look at those signs. No, hand washing means hand washing only. I, I would hate to see one big communication go out in September and then not have ongoing reminders to the staff and the students that they really have to abide by those yeah, rules. Yeah, that, no, that's a very good point. Um, so I'll, I'll certainly be working with the new principal, Sarah Levesque, and, uh to make sure that there is ongoing Periodic reminders. Periodic updates. Yeah. And my I swear it's the last question. Um, parents, has there been any communication to parents about you know, um, send your kids to school with a water bottle, but remind them to refill it from the polar and springs, just so parents. Can um, we will. It. We're going to be sending something out uh, tomorrow about, you know, the the update. This, and there are they encouraged to send in their own water bottles from home? I think they've been bringing water bottles <laughs> anyway. I don't. My I think that's do. part of the. Yeah. That's part, of the, part, of, part of the culture in all the schools. Okay. I don't think. So it's that. merely a matter of generally they bring their own water bottles. Where do you refill it from? Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, One more question. So with re regard to um, the MSBA review and the buildings, do, do we have an opportunity in that to say, you know, identify these are the things that have um, 
you know we know need to be addressed in these buildings you know like our, what we have laid out for the, the any capital plan or um, you know your uh, ongoing or periodic maintenance is that is that does that information get conveyed to the MSB when they're doing that you know they do a walkthrough you can't see lead in the water when you do a walk through the building you only know if if well they might they probably would if they see all the pull and spring uh, so I'm just wondering like what so that my understanding um, the last time this was done I believe was seven years ago by MSBA my understanding is that there's a two-part process is an extensive documentation process that's done first and then they come in oh, okay. um, and take a walk through of all the buildings so it's a two-part process we've not received any information yet on what that looks like I'm sure we will soon So um, just to the point about this, you know, what, what we're going to do and that this is an extraordinary circumstance that we may need some um, assistance from uh, the FinCon, you know, may need to go to them, but that this isn't a, it's, this is a solution for this year. It might also end up being the solution for next year unless we can do some remediation. I'm just sort of wondering if there's um, any, would there be any opportunity to sort of, um, uh, push on the code at all to be you know using a cheaper solution in terms of the, the residential use of the PEX which I'm sure is much cheaper and you could run on you could surface run so I'm just wondering like would there be a, a forum to pursue something that's less costly although we have to we don't even know what the cost of the pool and spring of, of the water bottled know. water um, is yet my understanding is we have to follow the, the the different codes that exist. Right, and just we, we you know, work with the building inspector if there was an opportunity to, to do that. You, I'm, I'm just uh, not to take it away. From no, no, no. But I, you, we would probably have to appeal to the state to oh. allow that, and I highly doubt that you're going to get them to allow it. I don't think the state plumbing code would change. Yeah, because like as the, Eric said, right. we're not the only ones going through this. So mm -hmm. if they changed it for us, they would have to change it for everybody. I just honestly don't see it happening. Would it be a much cheaper solution? Absolutely, but it, it, again, it would go against the code. I'd be a bit so, concerned about liability as well. No, but I, I'm just, you know, this is going to be a statewide issue, and it's throughout the state. Some, you know, it takes. I know it takes years to change the code, but the, it wasn't always something that could be used residentially. You know, somewhere along the way, somebody has to start pushing the envelope. <clears throat> there's different uh, there's different heat aspects too like a certain certain pipe uh, you know manages itself in a, in a fire of this tape and this this pipe doesn't and there could be uh, you know there's a reason why the, the code is commercially mm -hmm. things have to be a certain uh, you know uh, uh, parameter but um, one of the the navigation is to you know really to take a look at you know what's it going to cost us to make the the water fountains um, you know in any kind of uh, water filling area acceptable you know right. the uh, and if that's you know the the price is uh, you know one hundred and ninety thousand to to replumb the school uh, the co the cost is ninety thousand to to bust the ceiling down and run exposed you know pipe that's capped with some nice you know wood tone or whatever and then that that feeds just the the water fountain. And I'm assuming that over the time, the, the facilities would get together and we somewhat navigate through that. Okay. Yeah, if there was to be any type of repipe done, I think the only feasible thing to do would be just to repipe the bubbles, to rewater pipe the whole school. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just the bubbles. Okay. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? Did anyone in the public have questions on this issue? Yes. Yes, please do. And if you could identify yourself. Firstly, when was the last prior water testing done? Then when is the next one uh, scheduled for the other schools that did not test for lead? And also, does lead content change over a short period of time in water? To Dr. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, the, the last time the school was tested was <clears throat> prior to uh, this, this year being 2015, uh, excuse me, 2016 in April is when um, uh, schools fell under uh, which is called the LCC Act, the Lead Contamination Control Act, uh, which is very separate than the town testing for lead. So prior to uh, this year, uh, in um, when when things changed, which was April first, um, two sources in two schools need to be tested every testing cycle of the town for the water department, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of cycle. So. Lead testing cycles are either 
uh, six month, one year, or triennial, which is every three years. So we were at a certain place from previous testing that um, you know allowed us to to test um, you know two schools at two sources, and those um, those were on a cycle to test. So last time Killam was tested was about five years ago, and again, but at the time um, the. We were testing, you know, a, probably a fixture in the kitchen and a in a water fountain. Um, in 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 the past, um, it wasn't. Um, you didn't need to number that water fountain, nor did you have to number the fixture in the kitchen. It was just a kitchen and a water fountain. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, we, we went through, and it, the, the law changed. So we, we we now follow, you know, what's been. It's not even. A, it's 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 a federal EPA recommendation. That you follow the LCCA Act. It's not a, it's not a true law yet. Um, Mass DEP uh, recommends all water department and public schools follow it, um, but the, this, it's 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 um, it's optional if you can believe that. Um, so um, so in uh, in April uh, we cataloged all the schools. Uh, we tested um, uh, one. The the plan states that we put a full plan together was you know approved by Mass DEP. And it's, uh, we tested a third of the schools uh, in a three-year cycle. So every school had one-third of their sources tested. Uh, the next year, the second third, the next year, the third, the last third, and we were going to be done. And then you refile every five years. So on our first third testing, all the schools came clear with uh, all well below lead content except Killam, Birch, and, uh, and Coolidge. So then <clears throat> that prompted us to say, well, hey, you know what? We're not going to wait the three years. Um, let's, let's test the whole school right now. Like these are the ones we had an issue on. We're going to test the whole school. And that's kind of the place we've, we've quickly come to ascertain, you know, what the matter is and, and have certainly mitigated that. So it's, a, it's you know, acceptable. The other two questions? Yes. What is the next test for the other schools? Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll, uh, my the plan is to now do the second round, the the second third of those other schools this this coming year. So in the 2016-17 school year, and then the last third in the last year. We don't we, we, we don't anticipate any issues. Ever since uh, uh, 1986 is when um, you, lead solder was not allowed anymore. In 2012, uh, there's no uh, lead in any fixture. So um, and there was minimal. Um, lead and other sources so you know when we really did that first third and we cut the schools up we, we really did um, a full allocation of we didn't do just this third over here we did this one this one this one this one this one so we're really clear that uh, we, we don't think we're going to find any other issues in the other schools is what the results show us I believe I asked a similar question at a previous meeting. You did. Which, <laughs> which was, okay, so you do the three-year cycle, and then we keep doing that, right? Then in the fourth year, you go back to that first third, so that this isn't just three years. The ongoing protocol into the foreseeable future will be yeah. that every fixture is tested it's every three the, years. The, the, the way that, again, it's not, it's not law, uh, you know, but the way the EPA is, is it, this will soon be law, I would anticipate, in you know, a couple of years, but, but the way the EPA states is every, every five years you file, your your LCCA uh, plan, and in of those five years, the first three years you've you've tested, and so the last two years you're not testing, but then you test again. Um, so some communities uh, didn't have the funds to uh, to you know to, to put into testing, so they, they did it that way, you know. But uh, whatever plan we come up with would be something where the school department and uh, facilities and we, we, we come in water department, we come to a mutual, this is kind of the protocol we're going to follow. So I misspoke. It won't be every three years. It'll be every three to five years, depending That's on correct. what you... That's okay. Yeah. And again, a lot of these fixtures in, initially have never, ever been tested. So now it's when you start ascertaining, oh, that's a, you know, we find those out, then we can kind of go with that error even to take a look at those fixtures. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Um, so I just want to make a comment that uh, this is probably our second or third report, and third, um, report. third report. And thank Dr. Darty and our, our facilities and yeah. the uh, water department and MWRA ha has also been here for just the really the amazingly um, thorough focus, uh, the intensity that you guys have put on this, and you know how articulate really everyone has been about. Uh, what's going on and the level of uh, communication to the committee and to the community uh, about what's going on to assure that we're you know protecting uh, our students and our staff so I really appreciate the effort and I think it's a 
um, it's a testament to the collaboration that we have in Reading. Uh, so I wanted to really make sure that people recognize that and notice that. Thank so you. Thank you. Very good. All right. Thank you for being here this evening. Dr. Okay. Doherty, back to you. Well, thank you very much you. for being here again. So I take a sip of my design. <laughs> um, so now we talk about some educational things. Excellent. <laughs> um, so first, I just want to talk a little bit about our district leadership team and our administrative council uh, met uh, five days during the summer, two in July, and three in August. And what we normally do at our July retreat is we have a conversation where we reflect on the year, uh, focus on um, our action plans, the areas that we felt um, we did accomplish what we felt we could do. and the areas that we didn't and what are the areas that we want to focus on uh, for the following year based on the data that we have. Um, so we spend a significant amount of time looking at um, pretty much the same data that I presented to you um, about a month, two months ago um, to take a look at uh, areas that we felt that we needed to focus on for this upcoming year. Uh, we also had some training. Um, we brought in our uh, student legal counsel on student issues, um, Michael Joyce, uh, to uh, continue to update us on um, Chapter 222, which is the suspension, discipline, attendance, law, bullying, harassment, uh, 504s, um, special education, student records, and investigations. This, um, we, bring Mike, we try to bring Michael in at least once a year to help us, uh, to inform us. Um, you know, I believe we try to take a very proactive approach when we're faced with the situation, and we do bring in our legal counsel in early in a process so that we're not going down a road we shouldn't. Um, and that's, that's proved to be very, I think, helpful um, uh, over time. Uh, we had some discussions about the continued linkage of supervision and evaluation and how that connects with our goals. Um, and we, we had a, a good book discussion, uh, and I mentioned it today in my opening remarks. We, we read a book by Robert Putnam called uh, Our Kids. Um, and it takes a look at uh, how the opportunity gap has widened over the last several generations, particularly since the 1980s. Um, and it, it really prompted a lot of discussion about the students here in Reading and the types of things that we feel we need to do to close that opportunity gap, um, which then prompted the discussion of the areas that we felt we needed to focus on for this year. Um, so we began developing our draft action plans, which I will share with you once they're completed, um, very similar to what we did last year. Um, and we're focusing on four areas, K through 12, pre-K through 12, um, that we feel based on our data that we need to address. One is closing the achievement gap, particularly among our high need students, um, which includes special education, economically disadvantaged and English language learners, um, mathematics instruction, uh, literacy, not just English literacy, but literacy across all of the subject areas, um, and social emotional learning. So every school will be focusing on one or more of these four areas based on the data um, that is informing us for their school. Um, and they will be developing their school improvement plans based on that data and these action plans, which will then will derive um, principal's goals, teacher's goals. Um, so there's, there's a coherence and alignment of what we're trying to do. So that's pretty much what we spent at our five meetings discussing and talking about and having some really good um, group discussions about, about the things that we feel we need to do in the district um, to help support kids. A lot of that I captured in uh, the remarks today um, with, with staff as a, as a group. So I'm going to shift it over to Craig. Um, he's going to talk about all the things that are happening and sorry. Learning no, and teaching <laughs> um, that tie very much to what we just 
I just talked about. So just, um, how, how is each school collecting that data? To go over that again. How is each school collecting, collecting the data? Collecting the data that we just talked about that they're using to determine, you know, what are the priorities. So if you remember when I went through the goals with you, we had certain measures that we've been using as a district. <coughs> and those measures, some of them are focused on social emotional learning and include things like attendance, tardiness, um, in, in uh, how we're implementing uh, the um, MTSS framework, PBIS, throughout the district. Um, some of them are academic data. So we're taking a look at our state assessments. We're taking a look at um, some of the other academic data that we're using. Um, I think there was like 12 or 13 different areas that we were, we were focused on. So our data analyst that's funded out of the grant has been providing dashboards for each of the buildings. Similar to you received a district dashboard, they're going to be getting school-based dashboards with the areas that we've been discussing that align to those areas, those four areas I just talked did, about. Did we look at all it um, for the, the new term, I'm forgetting it, but DDMs, did we look at any the of that common data? Measures common that, measures. Right? The common measures we have in place, and we've been, I'm sure Craig can talk about that. I don't know if it's on your list or not, but I'm sure Craig can talk about that. Okay. So You're going to have to read that out loud because even I can't read I it. Know that. I apologize. <laughs> I think I have the same bullets here it on my computer. It looks bigger on yeah. my computer. No. <laughs> we thought we'd give you just a very quick overview of just some of the types of things that we've been working on this summer. And I may not go in order here. I might kind of chunk them at my topic a little bit. So I thought I'd start with the science. And I think I see elementary science up there. First, as you know, we are very um, excited at the end of the last year that we would be expanding our No Atom program. Um, we had piloted grade five last year. We're going to expand to grades three, four, and five this year. So actually, right at the end of the school year and the beginning of the summer, um, we had provided the first of some professional development with the No Adam folks, actually, to make sure that teachers are very familiar with the resources themselves and how to um, use them effectively in their classroom. Um, and that will be ongoing throughout the year. Um, and then jumping to grade six science, also, if you remember, I had updated you the um, McGraw-Hill iScience resources are now going to be used in sixth grade. And so we did have um, a professional development session with all of the sixth grade science teachers to be familiar with those resources. But also they've been um, meeting several times throughout the summer um, to look ahead to the year to plan because really they're, um, the major s switches I see, it's not so much the, the the resource, but the change in the curriculum. This is the first time, as you may be aware, that we're implementing a fully um, spiraling integrated curriculum at the middle level. So we'll be starting with sixth grade next year and then moving on to seventh the next after that and eighth and so forth, which we think which will be perfectly aligned with the new Massachusetts standards. But I also think we'll have a really positive impact with kids the way that that's spiral. So um, we anticipate that sometime just a little bit later in the year, um, with the help of the science teachers, we could provide more of an update and overview on how that's, how that's going. Um, writing and literacy, let me put a few of those together. Um, as you probably know, that's been a focus of ours for the last couple years. We've actually been working with the Teachers College um, out of Columbia University in New York. The last few years, we've had some um, what's called their homegrown writing institutes, um, summer institutes. We did that again, um, focusing more on, our, on K2, and we had several of our teachers um, involved in that. We even had a couple of our teachers, including our um, literacy coach, Ms. Stodden, at, um, actually go to New York to attend a week-long um, session at Teachers College. Wow. Um, I'll throw in also this year, I believe it was the beginning of July, the International, the 2016 International Literacy Association Conference just happened to be in Boston this year. And so I actually attended that with um, Tricia Stodd and our literacy coach and several of our teachers, several of our teacher leaders attended that. That's just, a, a, you know, not only a national conference, but an international conference where there were thousands of people in attendance to get to see some of the very best well-known educators, not only in the country, but internationally. Um, I joked, you know, I was able to sort of meet and see present Dr. John Hattie, which we've done work with in our district. Um, got there early, we wanted to make sure, and we realized it was a room that held 1,100. 
and that was just one session that many were being held at the same time. So, but it was a, an amazing conference. So we made sure that we had staff members that were able to take uh, advantage of that opportunity um, right here in Boston at the Heinz Convention Center. Um, curriculum work, we did a, a bunch of curriculum work, not only in, with our, I worked with our coaches, our teacher leaders, and even was cons consulting and collaborating with some other districts, taking a look at a number of areas, um, not only our, our curriculum to make sure that it's aligned, but also just the, the vertical perspective. Um, not only making sure that we have the curriculum documents that we've been working on, but also that um, we're sort of planning ahead for the year in terms of the professional development that we need to offer to teachers throughout the year and how we could collaborate with some other districts in some cases in those areas. And so we did a lot of pretty extensive work in that. Um, what else do I have out there? This, oh, I think we mentioned once before, but we, Reading also presented at the Mass, MASS, which is the um, Massachusetts Superintendents Conference um, that's held each year um, on the Cape. Um, and that's great because Reading was seen as, is seen as a leader in the work for the social emotional learning. Um, and we had several staff members who actually presented to other districts there on MTSS, our PBIS work. Um, you may remember also we've been working with the last couple of years, um, Jean Thompson Grove is the specific consultant we've been working a lot with um, through with the school reform initiative. Um, and the, the feedback we've been getting on all of her PD has just been absolutely outstanding. Um, and she was able to offer several things this summer, not only to Reading but in the region. So we offered her some space to provide some things here, which also gave us some more slots um, at no cost for our district. Um, so several topics there, things like um, designing adult learning, facilitative leadership, critical friendship, all really essential skills to build our capacity for our professional learning communities, working with our teacher leaders and how you really facilitate the work of adult learning, adult collaboration. Um, and then um, one called Teaching All Kinds of Minds which is really looking, using sort of a, um, a neurodevelopmental lens to look at how students work and the actual student work that they produce. Um, Jean has done a workshop, I know she presented at our Blue Ribbon Conference, so she's done some workshops and some one day um, things that people have just raved about. This was a full, I believe it was a three or four day course, and we had a number of teachers in that, and they, each one of these, when I would see teachers afterwards, they would, I actually even had a teacher to me today say, if you need me to be a cheerleader for more people to attend these types of things, let me know. Because again, the feedback has, has been outstanding. Um, and you uh, met the new teachers today, but I mean, I was able to spend a few days with them through their week of induction and orientation. Um, and I do, I say it every year, which is how, what a great experience it is. Um, but this group was absolutely out outstanding. Um, and I think part of it, you know, as I was talking with just their professionalism, their eagerness, their positive attitude, they thrilled to be in Reading. It's always interesting, too, when you get people coming from outside other districts, um, the things that they really mean a lot to them. For instance, they really openly were saying how wonderful it was to be coming to a district that really was valuing opportunities for teachers to collaborate, to work together, to tackle challenges together. Um, and, I, and one of the things that really struck home to me, um, or hit home to me this time, was when you have a group that has such a wide range of experience, you saw it today, from you know, some people right out of college to people with 20, 25, 27 years experience, and you get all of those people working together and learning from each other. Um, it was great, I was just so impressed with their comments and their willingness to continue learning and growing. Um, so that's just sort of a sampling. It's been a busy summer, it went, went fast. Yeah, uh, Yes. so a couple questions. Um, how, how did the uh, Adam training go? How was it received? I'm sorry, Mr. How did the Adam training go? No Adam. Oh, wow. No good. Adam. Good. Yep. Um, good. As I said, that's the beginning of it. I mean, that was really to make sure that people are familiar with the resources themselves. Um, and how it works. We'll have follow-ups. Um, we'll probably do one a couple months into the year, make sure how, um, how that's going. Um, I mean, one of the benefits for elementary teachers of that particular program is that it, it pretty much is sort of a 
can't stop shopping. Uh, you know, I don't know what the metaphor would be, but it's it's right there, and and things are coming um, as you need them. So it really provides. There's no way really to present this to kids without giving them that hands-on sort of experience. Um, so. Any feedback from the folks that went? Um, yeah, I mean, informally, I haven't done anything formal yet, but informally, it was positive. Um, Will we do anything formally? Yeah, I mean, I think as we get going, yeah. I mean, um, we usually do surveys and things about professional development to make sure that um, people's needs are being met. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then, um, you talked about the uh, conference that was uh, attended in Boston by. So, how will that information that you gained, how will that be distributed back to staff? Uh, I think it really informs our work, not only with our curriculum, but also um, the priorities. Um, we've been working, I think um, Dr. Doherty mentioned it, as we were working with the district leadership team, and the teacher leaders also, in our action steps and things through with our goals. Um, literacy is one of the areas, not only in English language arts, but across the other curriculum areas, science, social studies, how it pertains. Um, able to see how, what, you know, what it really looks like um, in, pra in practice in different classrooms. Um, and so, I mean, there are many sort of takeaways that I think will absolutely be conversations, talking points, follow-up opportunities in our professional learning communities. So I think that's where we'll start to see it first. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I actually had a question, I think kind of in a similar vein. How do you determine, and I, you answered it a little bit through your comments, it sounds like you take a lot of teacher feedback to determine the value of a professional development experience. But how can you tie it to student outcomes? Do you know, how can you say, you know, they, they attended this workshop and we are seeing measurable improvement in student writing or measurable improvement in student understanding of math concepts? How do you, how do you bridge that? Because ultimately that's what makes the investment worth it, right? Um, yeah, and I think that's something we're getting better and better at about common measures and how we use our data to do that you know my hope this year I think we've been getting better at it um, each of the last two years is that the, the work of the professional learning communities is essentially that to be looking at the student output the actual student work that's being produced um, to make sure that it's that we're sort of calibrated in our expectations that we're seeing the type of growth from all students um, and that's something that uh, we are continually building capacity on because um, you know, this last Thursday, actually, I was part of, I was invited to be a part of a conference call um, with the state about common measures. Um, it was sort of an honor in a way because we were asked as, at Reading to sort of help some other districts that are really struggling with that. Um, and I made clear it wasn't as if I thought that we were a model in any way in terms of, oh, we have all of the right measures in place and it's all, you know, firing in all cylinders because I don't think, I don't think any district really is there. I certainly know we're not quite there yet. But the reason that the state was so interested in having us be a part of that um, conference call was because of the structures and the capacity that we're building for that work. Um, and it's the state's realization, I think, that that capacity is what's going to ultimately benefit the kids. It's not, um, and we had some open conversation even about the issue of impact ratings and things, and that it really isn't about a rating. Um, there's no way sometimes to effectively or accurately distill um, an educator's impact into a particular rating. But the work itself, by like getting teachers together to explore, you know, what is it that we want students to be learning? How do we know that they're getting it? Are they all growing? Um, that just giving teachers that opportunity and guiding them through that work benefits kids because then we can really do what you're what you're saying, which is track their progress effectively. Um, and a lot of districts are, have trouble with that, you know, um, putting those structures in place or they found that it's just about compliance. You know, they just sort of put in a bunch of you know, commercial measures or certain things and people s certainly administer the assessments um, and then there's some formula in a spreadsheet that could put together a rating, but it really doesn't have an impact on kids that way. It really requires the educator collaboration for it to have that. Um, so I am, I'm, I'm excited that um, I think we're getting better and better at that and that the state was recognizing that that was a really important part of it. 
Thank you. At some point, could you share the uh, the uh, common measures that are being used throughout the district at each grade level and subject area? I'd be interested in hearing about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. Anything else? Yeah, this is done. Yeah. For the ones that are listed there, my hope is that very soon this fall we'll be able to make some, some of this public. Um, the, you mentioned the coaches. I mean, the coaches have been a big help, as many of our teachers have been, um, but it really wasn't a responsibility of the coaches to be a coordinator of curriculum. They really are instructional, about instructional practices. Um, so, I mean, all of us have been working together to do this um, and together with other districts as well so we've been kind of you know collaborating with all sorts of people and been doing that work Yeah, the, yeah there's, there's a difference between right, the two. Right. <clears throat> Those are the coordinators. Right. right. We instance, don't have any coordinators. In for instance, district. districts who have um, uh, curriculum coordinators, um, they're often our administrative positions, so their job actually is literally to coordinate curriculum, to make sure documents are in place, um, to help with professional development, can do observations of teachers, can help with um, write-ups, evaluation, all of that sort of things to make sure that things are aligned horizontally, vertically, and so forth in the district. Um, and we haven't had, traditionally had those positions. But we're uh, still somehow that we are trying our best to make sure that we get some documents. You know, I, I always say it's hard, what I've learned over the years is sometimes it's hard for us to all be on the same page if it's not literally be on a page. Um, so that's what we've been trying to do is to get some of the most essential things on a page. Um, and I'll be saying to staff, I don't consider them carved in stone. I think any um, curriculum is a living document. It should be reviewed annually at the end of each year. You know, what's working, what's not? Are there things that we need to spend a little more time on? Things like that. Um, but it's just important to get them on a page so that's a good starting place. So we've been working on that. Yep. Thank you, so Mr. Martin. Karen's, yep. Carolyn's going to talk a little bit about what's been going on in student services this summer. All right. So the biggest um, piece that we coordinate in the summer in the student services office is the extended school year program for students with special education needs. We service about 250 students pre-K to 12 over the summer and have about 60 staff members who work with those students. Our program runs this year. We made the determination to run our program for five weeks instead of six weeks. We extended some program hours for our more intensive um, students. So they came an hour more every, um, every day. It's four days a week. Some of the highlights of the program this summer is that we collaborated with Kids Club this summer, which was really exciting. And we had opportunities for the students in our extended school year program to participate daily in Kids Club um, with students without disabilities, which often isn't an opportunity that we have in extended school year programming. But we're very thankful to Kids Club. They worked really closely with us. We also had opportunities for different program classes to come together and do some social activities together. Um, and then we had a group of parents that made a donation and so we used that funding to have bug works come in for our elementary program and it was a great opportunity. All the students had an opportunity to hold bugs and ask questions. So it really made the program a lot of fun. We don't want students to just 
come and feel that it's, it's torture to be here in the summer. Um, we also had our middle school compass program continue to work on some of their life skills. They did a walking field trip to a convenience store to work on some of those safety skills using money. Um, they did also some cooking over the summer. So um, overall, the feedback I've had is it went very smoothly um, because there wasn't as much road construction. We didn't have as many transportation <laughs> issues this summer, which is always pleasant. Um, people seem to be arriving and leaving on time. So that was a big piece of our summer. As Mr. Martin mentioned, curriculum work, we did a lot of curriculum work in student services as well. What is really exciting about that is we didn't send, you know, these teachers didn't necessarily go off to professional development. They came forward and said, we want to do some work out of the um, PLC work they've been doing all year. They wanted to continue some work in different program areas. Our bridge program did work. The Crossroads teachers got together and did some ongoing curriculum work to really create that vertical alignment. Um, and they had some target areas in, in math in particular and how we provide instruction um, to students with disabilities in math and this was kind of came out of some work we did during the school year with Mahesh Sharma so it was nice to see a continuation over the summer and for those staff members to continue that um, in terms of some of the professional development we did offer for staff we hosted a training here for high school and middle school teachers with landmark school on study skills and executive functioning. We had about 17 of our teachers attend, both um, content area teachers and special education teachers, um, and which was a fantastic opportunity. Um, the teachers left with very concrete things they could apply in their classrooms. It's not a canned program, it's just strategies they can use, and people love that, and we're hoping to redo that training again this fall for the high school as well. We sent three elementary special ed teachers to the Seeing Stars program. So if you recall in the spring, we went through the, um, all the special ed teachers and the reading programs they are, the number of reading programs they're trained in. And in doing that inventory, we've identified where some of our gaps are. So we're starting to send targeted staff members to different specialized reading program training. So this summer we had three elementary special ed teachers and then there'll be some more teachers going off to training this fall. Um, we also sent a group of middle school teachers to training at the Landmark School. So Landmark provides outreach. And so we had six um, special ed staff members. We had a team chair, speech and language pathologist, and four special ed teachers who participated in things at the Landmark School. Um, in addition, we um, worked with our team, team chairs. We have been doing MTSS work um, throughout the summer. So our building leadership teams, our district-wide leadership teams have been doing planning um, throughout the summer. We're continuing with youth mental health first aid. Um, I had the opportunity to provide the mandated um, training for our employees which is always exciting. I try to make it as exciting as possible. Um, I did that during the new staff orientation and, and then today I had the opportunity to meet with our custodians, uh, food service, and secretaries um, to review all those mandated training topics. Um, and then we're just really working, this summer I did a lot of work on just identifying some priorities and how we want to use our professional development funds to move forward and support our students with special education needs. We've also identified new curriculum leaders to help facilitate some of our professional learning communities. So it's very exciting. We have um, some teachers who have really stepped forward who want to be teacher leaders in the era of special education. So we're excited about that as well. Uh, question, um, so we're the post program, so were they, yes. um, how did that weave into this then? Um, they are continuing. We had students um, in that program this summer as part of the extended school year program. We actually had some students who um, are transitioning from high school age, so instead of participating in what we offer here, they actually went to the post program for the oh. summer. Mm -hmm. So it really gave them an opportunity to expand their social network, expand some of the opportunities that they had. So, you know, we're continuing that partnership and moving along and okay. hopefully continuing to have students enrolled there. So I just want to uh, go over a couple of other things. Enrollment, so uh, you have in front of you a purple sheet of paper, which I will pass out to you.
this is where we stand today. Um, we are still getting phone calls every day, so this, <laughs> this, today we had a couple more. So um, I think uh, you can see that you know we are certainly trying extremely hard to, to follow the guidelines. We, we do have a couple areas um, that we are concerned about, but given the fact that we did have to reduce the budget by two elementary teachers, um, the, the class sizes right now I, I think are pretty good. Um, we do have a lower kindergarten class, uh, which, which is interesting. Um, there are 30 to 40 students, which is a normal number, that, that either the families chose not to send their child to kindergarten or went to private kindergarten. Um, so some of those students will be coming into first grade next year and uh, we'll start hearing about those students. Um, so that, that number will fluctuate a, a, a little bit for, ne for next year in grade one, uh, next year's grade one. Um, but you can see we have um, tried uh, to keep those balanced. Uh, we, we do have a couple tools that we use. One is um, the option when, uh, when families move in and how, uh, depending on how close they are in a in a school this in a school area to have them move to one school or another based on the class size, we've done that. Um, we do have uh, grades three to five, especially in grade five. We have a couple areas, uh, Birch Meadow and Killam, where the class sizes are at right at 25 or just below 25. Um, Wood End in grade three, Killam in grade three or at, at 24. Um, and then wood end grade two is a, is a little bit high on the, and, and grade one is a little bit high. Um, so we, we are doing everything we can to, to keep the class sizes at, at respectable levels. Um, we did, we were helped a little bit by the lower kindergarten enrollment. It allowed us to add, not add, to shift a teacher uh, to Joshua Eaton in grade one. Because um, there were only gonna be three first grade teachers, we were able for, to, to move, um, to a teacher there. So that's where we are right now with, with enrollment. We, do, we did get at the high school, and I don't have the, the enrollment of the high school yet, um, we did get 20 new students at the high school this year. Um, some are returning from private school, um, but a lot of first time students. Um, so that that's be interesting to see how that, that plays out. Hmm? Town. Yeah. Are they concentrated at any one grade level, or kind of dispersed nine through twelve? Uh, I honestly don't know. I don't. I don't know that level of detail. But I do know Mr. Baca telling me the other day that they've had twenty new students uh, enrolled this summer. That's a lot. Um, it looks. Do you have any concerns about the upcoming fifth grade class? Three hundred and seventy-two seems a little bit high. And have you started discussions with the two middle school principals about that number going into middle school? And then how does that compare to other grades currently there? Um, before we start the budget process for this year, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, we have had large grades come through before the middle schools, so I'm not concerned at this point. Mm -hmm. It also depends on how it's going to break out um, from a district, you know, how many go to Parker, how many go to Coolidge. So we'll start, we'll start do, looking at that. So once we get the October 1 enrollment for all the schools, we'll start planning on what next year could look like. Okay. Dr. Doherty, when do we, when do you typically update? Is it October, the enrollment? Is that when we hear it? CDA? We're updating it on a regular basis. October 1 is what we have to report to the state each year. Right. But we, we have a running, and Linda's always updating this for our benefit. And we I believe them. I gave this to you in July also. And we receive those. We you receive those. Them. Yeah, yeah, you do. You receive them on a regular basis. Yep. Yeah, this is one. Uh, Dr. Doherty, I just, um, this Maybe it'll get us a little bit into the next topic, but um, I think one of the things that's really important um, and that I would like to see uh, as we move forward is uh, a, a projection of what the class size guidelines would need to be if we were to be in a situation where we need to reduce by 30 FTE across the district. I think that that's really, um, as I recall from uh, my own personal experience, uh, in the early 2000s, the uh, 
you know, if, if that if if we're forced into a situation where we do not get the funding that uh, the selectmen have basically put before the community, it's going to mean a different thing about that about what the class size guidelines will be. And the the guidelines that we use now were developed um, at least a year or so after the previous override was passed. Um, and prior to that, there were either no guidelines. Um, so I think it's really important in terms of our responsibility to help um, to help ourselves and the community understand you know what the impact will be this is something that I think is very relatable um, and I and I know this is elementary and we, we usually look at the guidelines sort of K to two three to five but I'd also ask that we um, put together some information that would provide some projection for the middle school um, at that time um, uh, in the early 2000s those class sizes were we had some 30s, um, e some easy 30s um, at, the at the middle school and the high school. And I know the high school's harder to get a handle on, but um, you know, one of the other things that I recall there, and I don't know how you can sort of put numbers around this though, is that you, um, you, know, you can't offer as many sections of a particular class. And that means that students don't, may not be able to get what they want this year they wait a year, you know, they're, they're sort of waiting their turn to get that limited resource. And in the meantime, it sometimes means either they're in a, in maybe in a class that isn't optimal or they end up with more studies. And I, I know that the previous um, situation, we ended up with sort of many more studies than we wanted. So I don't know if that would become an issue um, for us, you know, going forward if we're, you know, forced to make that level of cut. But I would like to see that. I think it would help inform the committee and the c community. Um, I think it's a very good idea, particularly in, in terms of transparency. Um, I, we are getting into the next topic, so yeah. we, can, we can talk about it a little bit then. But I, I think it's a really good idea. And we'd want to be really thoughtful about what we communicated and how we communicated it. About. Mm -hmm. It's a very valid point, Mrs. Well. At, at some point, Dr. Doherty, can we get the information regarding what what we can actually do as school committee members, what we can, you know, types of statements we can make, or what can we do? It's actually in your packet. Oh, is it? Yep. Oh. Oh. Are we talking yeah. about for the S state ethics? Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's just before the calendar. Oh, great. Ooh, campaign and ballot question, political activity. Yeah. You read my mind? Yeah. And that's, that's an important point, Mr. Nyan, because there's sort of, before there's an official ballot question, there's a set of rules and guidelines. And then once, and we're at the point now where there is an official there ballot an question. Official so ballot this question. is a good opportunity for any appointed or elected official to remind themselves of what um, what is ethically allowed and what is not. So, And, and I think, I mean, I, we, we will need to be mindful of that, but I, I think, you know, I'm asking for the data so that we can, and I think that's our responsibility is to be able to say, you know, what, what would we do with this uh, plan to do with this money? Should we get that funding? What happens if we don't get that funding? What's the impact and what does that look like? And I think when we were at the selectmen's meeting on the 16th, uh, one of the points that was emphasized as the selectmen were looking at our data, and some of them may have been looking at our data for the first time, were sort of saying, how do you make sure that's in layman's terms because they're not used to talking you know they talk municipal and we talk schools and so i think it just drives a point that we need to make sure that we're sort of getting that in terms that a parent can understand what is that impact to me and my child so yeah it says right on here the ocpf has stated that officials may analyze the impact of ballot questions yes. so it says right in there mm -hmm. that that is well within Anything the purview of what we data should do driven informational that's that's perfectly yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have continued um, to work this summer uh, to, to replace computers, and we, I think we have a good, good handle on that. We uh, were able to, uh, again, replace a lot of our older machines. Um, as you know, we have uh, upgraded our website. Um, I, I will tell you, you know, um, and I'm a little bit about uh, based on what Mrs. Downing asked earlier. A lot of the work to get the website where it is now was internal work. Um, Redeker doesn't move the things from Edline to um, to to this to this new website. Um, the the portal, which is a whole new tool, it's something that we didn't have with Edline, where parents 
uh, go in with a password um, and they are able to access uh, once we've got it up and running fully, they're going to be able to access their child's schedule, demographic, in, certain demographic information, the ability to edit certain information, um, which will eliminate the oh, pupil nice. emergency card piece. Um, this year we decided to do a transition um, because we didn't want to uh, make people anxious right away. So it, it's, it, there's still some paper involved, but the, um, some of the, the more easier demographic information we are going to have parents edit online. That goes into a queue that then it gets accepted before it becomes a final edit. So we want to make sure that the editing is, is, a, is, a, is appropriate. Um, but this was all done internally, pr primarily by our four technology integration specialists who really didn't get a summer. Um, they spent a lot of time with this, learning the system. Uh, they're doing the training for our staff. Um, they trained our principals. They trained us. Um, on, on how to do the website piece, the portal piece. There's a grade book piece that integrates with the portal. Um, so everything is now an integrated system, whereas before we had the Redeker system, which was the student information management piece. We had Edline, which was a third party, which, which did connect, but it didn't connect fully because it wasn't the same company. Um, you had a grade quick, grade AP web piece, which again was a third party company. So now everything is the same group, and it's all integrated. So that if you make a change here, the change is made over here automatically. Mm -hmm. You don't have to make sep separate changes. Um, so we're, it's certainly it's still a work in progress. There's a lot of pieces still we're trying to do. One of them is getting all of the back, the previous information updated. Um, but we're, we've heard very positive comments from, from parents so far about the new websites, and um, I know the principals have been working very hard on their school-based websites. Our sub-pages are still a work in progress um, because Redica didn't give us templates for those, so we've been creating our own templates, which is a little bit uh, more cumbersome. So, um, you know, we are excited about it, and it's still it's still a work in progress. We still are keeping all of our social media tools. Um, so the blog, the blog I have, Twitter, Facebook for the school district, that's still going to be in place, but we've put that information also on, on the news, it's, so we're going to do it in multiple places, so you can get it all on the website, or you can get it through the social media. Um, so we are, you know, we're going to continue to find different avenues for, for parents and staff to keep informed. So, question. So, um, one question I have regarding the use of the portal by parents. Um, have we done anything in terms of, um, you know, particularly if parents are looking at grades, have we done anything in terms of setting up some protocols that, you know, my concern would be the teachers might get additional emails or questions about grades. Um, I know, speaking back in my Danvers days, that was an issue. And yep. you know, yeah, so we are working those out right now. Um, I know at the middle school, I'll give that as an example, right now the middle school is going to be updating. Uh, so they're, they're essentially eliminating progress reports and they're, they're updating the grades every two weeks, mm -hmm. um, a minimum of two weeks. So there may be teachers that just update them all the time, but the expectation is that they'll be updated every two weeks. I believe the high school, that's going to be a similar expectation. The elementary is going to be a little bit different because right. uh, of the standards-based report right. card. But, um, yeah, we are setting up those protocols. So um, what I was thinking more about um, parents re requesting information and you know a process maybe that would um, alleviate some of the emails that make I mean I know if I was a parent and I'm looking at it, what the heck's happening here I might right. shoot an email off I guess what I'm saying is, is an example that I saw in Davis was there was a requirement that the student had to go talk to the teacher first mm -hmm. if there was a question relevant to the parent sure. jumping right in um, I believe that's in place now at the high school I think that is, it, that okay. is encouraged I'm, I'm not sure at the middle school that's in place but um, I know those discussions are happening at the building level. Okay. And it, it, because this is a new system, those are the types of things we will also, I'm sure we're going to learn as we go through it. Okay. The whole idea of this is, um, and this, a piece of this is from the communication audit, is we're trying to improve communication um, oh. on prog child's progress. I'm absolutely I, behind it. I think it's a great, great way to inform parents and, and let everybody know what's going on. Absolutely. You're right, though. The elementary one will be 
Yeah, that would be a little bit so. different. Can I just? Yep. So I, I think it's an important point. I think the high school handbook does have somewhere in it, you know, what that protocol is that the student needs to talk to the uh, teacher. I think it's really important because I, I think we, as a, as a parent, I guess speaking for myself, you know, have a propensity to want to jump in, and it's, it's such, it's the, it's the biggest disservice that I think I have done my sons in like lack of in, in terms of preparing them for college because the one really really important skill they have to have is being able to advocate for themselves and you know know when it's time to advocate for themselves and you know I I definitely I did too much I don't think that I'm I'm alone in that and um, you know that and it's so easy because you see the grade and you can just click email and you know Mr. Yeah. or Mrs. so-and-so what's up with this and you didn't even talk to your kid about it right. let alone talk to them about what's the right approach here now with this are you happy with this grade you know I mean I think there's there's so much that we can do if we stop ourselves from clicking the next button and the danger in that is the advocacy and I really I think I did a slightly better job with my youngest son <laughs> but it was it's been really difficult I um, agree the older I think so. the, the one area like it's, it's new to the middle school yeah and that's what was the biggest problem in Danvers was um, you know that particular but I think you know the great thing about it is there shouldn't be any surprises I mean, mm. you know I, I know I've been surprised back in the day with you got what in science and you know and never knowing about it mm. and uh, you know now there's absolutely no reason for that to occur and I think that's only going to enhance student learning, or at least students might not like it so much, but it will certainly be, I think, in the long run, you know, advantageous to have this in place. So yeah, I just I'm, think I'm excited you're right to see about, it in place. Yeah, the protocol, I think you're right about. <coughs> and then the only, uh, the last piece I just want to bring up, and this is something that was talked about the Arcosa meeting the other night, um, is we are moving forward as a community which the schools will have um, uh, be able to benefit from, uh, the Interface Referral Service of William James College. If you remember Erica when she came in, when we were talking about the opioid law and the changes, Erica came in and talked about this. Um, so we've been able to secure funding through three sources, uh, the Arcasa Grant, the Hospital Trust, and I know that there's another grant through Winchester Hospital that we've applied for, uh, or I should say Erica has applied for to help fund this, it's a, it's a two year commitment. And really what it does is um, it helps families access the referral system, which can get very, very complicated um, and lead to roadblocks, which sometimes doesn't get the services that students and families need. So this could be mental health counseling, this could be um, uh, substance abuse counseling, it, it depends on the situation. Uh, this is open to the entire community, not just to students. Um, we will be using it with our SBIRT process um, that we're doing in grade 9 that we're piloting this year. Uh, that if there is a student that through the process we've identified as someone that needs the additional help, uh, we, will, we will refer the family to this process, uh, to this referral service. Um, and so uh, I just want to say that we are moving forward with this. At the time when I think Erica was um, presenting it to you, we were not sure if we were going to be able to, but we are, we are definitely moving forward with it because we do have the grant funding for two years and so I think that's a phenomenal service to the community and to our students who might be in crisis but I do want to clarify that that funding will not be coming out of the school operating no it's budget. not operating yep, budget. it's all coming from no, grants okay. and, and Mr. Quorum had a question <laughs> Jeffrey Quorum 31 Ridge Road on the website upgrade I like I've heard a couple times um, that there's kind of vague plans to uh, involve parent groups in particular PTO so as treasurer of the PTO at the high school and outgoing treasurer at Coolidge, we'd like to be informed about how to set up the PTO sections. Um, there's nothing there now. We're already you know, asking parents, families to contribute dues. We'd like to show them what our budgets are. Yeah, and I believe Mrs. Grant did send an email back to you saying that we are, you know, to be patient. We're a work in progress. We're already. Yeah, that's you know. the sub page issue that I was referring to earlier. Right. Uh, the development of the sub pages is taking longer than the main school pages because we are developing the templates ourselves. And so I know that they're developing a template specifically for PTO. 
Um, they're doing the best they can. We, yeah. we aren't nice getting to, any additional help from Radica on this, um, so we're doing the best we can. It would be nice to involve the PTOs in I mean, you're presenting a template for us. Well, it's a standard I, template that we're all using. Um, so are there certain things that I, as a PTO officer, need to find on those pages? And I, I want to be sure that people developing these pages no, will no, the understand template, that. No, no, the template is just the framework. You get to add the content. Okay. And we'll, you know, we'll show you how to do that once the template is formed. Do you have a guesstimate as to when that might I, be? I don't. I mean, I mean right now they're, they're, this month, they're trying to get school March? started. I, I don't. I don't. Okay. I really, I honestly I mean, don't. I know that Mrs. Grant sent you an email because uh, I was CC'd on it that, you know, they're, it's a, they're doing the best they can. Well, what I'm saying is I got, I, I I got vague plan. I don't have a date right now. I'm sorry. I don't. I know they're trying to get school started right now. Any other questions? Was that it, Dr. Doherty, or some more? Um, that was, that was, well, actually, no, wait a minute. Um, so I do want to do a, a couple of pieces that I introduced today to staff too because um, I think it's important for the community here. Um, this is on the, the main page of our website. Um, and this vision has actually been in place for a couple years now. This is not something that, that's new, um, but I think it's something that it's, it's good to come back and take a look at and there's some key words that I think are really describing what we have been working on for the last few years, and I think where we're, where we're going. Um, you know, the, the phrase instill a joy of learning has been something that we've had on our letterhead. Um, inspiring, engaging, and supporting our youth. Uh, meaningful and relevant curriculum. Innovative instructional practices. Strong analysis and thoughtful dialogue about evidence. A collaborative and team approach to learning and teaching. These are things that um, I know Mr. Martin just talked about in his um, presentation uh, of, you know, these are the things that we're trying to build is the capacity and the framework so that teachers can be working together, teachers are talking about student work, teachers are sharing data, they're sharing the practices that they're doing in the classroom. For the last two years we've been building that framework, which is exciting to see now that teachers are starting to get it at each level. Um, and I, and, I, and I think that's, that's the exciting part about teaching, and teaching in our school district, is that our teachers now are empowered to be working with each other and making the decisions that are gonna benefit kids. Um, we also wanna make sure that there's a safe and nurturing learning environment. That's through the MTSS piece that we've been working on, um, again, as a district. The physical and behavioral well-being, um, there are, you know, there are, certainly there are plans moving forward on how we're going to address that. A shared responsibility of both the schools and community. Um, that's like something that is, we're having that conversation right now as a community. And then how school district and town government are working cooperatively and collaboratively. Again, these are all things that we wrote, I think two or three, three years ago now we wrote this vision. Um, and that, you know, it's something that, that is starting to come to, to fruition. So I did want to highlight that, which I, I did talk about in my remarks this morning. I also want to talk a little bit about our logo, uh, which we're starting to have, we have on all our letterheads for the district. And you notice that each school has their own logo um, on their website. Um, when we unveiled the, the websites, um, that was, you know, a part that we wanted to make sure is that that the core values and the logos were in place on the different um, school pages and the district page. So we, um, the district logo, we're using the tree. The tree represents growth, um, not only of our students, but our staff as well. Uh, we feel that it's very important that everyone is learning and growing. Um, the leaves represent the students. The roots represent, um, you know, the, the support that we give our students and our staff as they as they learn and grow the the circle that you see going around the tree represents the journey that the um, a student takes from pre-k to 12 um, their educational journey through the Reading Public Schools um, and then the, the three uh, I guess core values you could say is the learning supporting and growing piece the learning piece um, is that certainly we are all learners not just our students but our staff as well continuous learners um, that the decisions that we make in the district are prioritized on improving learning for students 
and that the instructional practices are focused on engaging students and differentiating to their needs. The supporting piece, we want to make sure we have the supports in place at all the different tiers. So the tier one, all students are getting that support. Tier two and three will be for students that are struggling um, and need additional support and interventions. And then our staff are going to be supported with adequate materials, supplies, technology, supervision. And then the growing piece, we want to make sure our students are getting the adequate support that they need so they can develop as learners who are ready for college, career, and life. And then our teachers and administrators are developing the capacity through professional development and collaborative work um, so that they can grow and learn as professionals. So that's our logo. That's the direction that we're heading. Again, it's very consistent to our vision and the things that we have been working on for the last couple of years. So I just wanted to share that with you, that you probably saw this tree one day show up on a letterhead and wondering what it is, and we wanted to, you know, introduce it at the beginning of the school year. So um, that's, what, that's what it is. Um, so. Mr. Nine. So I've read the vision numerous times, and you know, I think it's well done. And I'm just, I was always curious, though, how was it put together? Who was involved? <coughs> I, it's kind of evolved from staff, administrators. Um, two or three years, three years ago, when we wrote it, we did get a lot of feedback from from different groups <coughs> of what we felt. We did a protocol, a visioning exercise at the time mm -hmm. that allowed us to to get to that point. Curious. It was only three years ago, or was it? No, no, no. There was, uh, was this. Before. This is the excerpt vision we oh, wrote okay. three years ago. We had a greater vision, bigger vision that we wrote in 2008. Okay. Anything else from the committee? Because that vision was four pages long, I think. So <laughs> right. we probably should make yeah, it a little bit small. No, but I mean, really? so <laughs> it, but so it's a. It was sort of a process that started at least that long yes. ago. But then you're yes. saying there was some effort through that. Yes. So for reports, are we at the end? That's it, yes. Okay. I, sorry it was a longer one, but. Yeah, well, it, I'm, it's my fault. We started 30 minutes ahead of schedule, and we're <laughs> 40 minutes behind schedule. Um, we anticipated, thank you, thank Dr. Doherty, thank you for all of that. It's obviously been a busy summer, and everyone's been um, um, very busy, and I think it's going to um, really pr produce some good products for our students this upcoming school year. So. Um, we had an anticipation that this would happen, but given the late hour and the fact that Mr. Robinson cannot join us tonight, and it's kind of traditional practice that the entire body be present to do the superintendent's um, evaluation, Dr. Doherty has graciously agreed to allow us to put that off till the next meeting. So we will be postponing his evaluation until our meeting on September 19th, which I believe means the only thing left to discuss tonight is a continued discussion of the FY18 budget with a particular focus on Given the selectmen's vote a couple of weeks ago, um, what does that mean for us at the school committee? Um, at the school level, what will we prioritize um, and communicate to the voters? So I think that is our last agenda item for the evening. That yes? is correct. Okay, great. Dr. Bird, do you want to kick us off on that? Sure. Um, and so you have in front of you a memo, and yes. I'll pass on mm -hmm. else. Several weeks ago, we were at this slide, um, if you remember, and we, um, for several meetings, had uh, discussions about what we felt were our challenges for the school district and what we felt were the resources that we needed to address those challenges. Um, this has been over a year-long process, um, which has involved the community through several community forums, has involved um, <coughs> staff discussions, has involved several school committee meeting discussions. Um, and so when this list was put together, uh, it, there was a lot of thought put into it. And I believe at the time the committee purposely did not want to prioritize this list for that very reason, is that all of these items were important. And so when the, um, the decision was made uh, for, by the Board of Selectmen for the amount of funding for the override, it's $7.5 million, and the amount that the schools would receive would be $2.96 um, million. 
if the override successfully passes, at that point we did have to make some decisions. And um, you know, I, I think it's important to note that everything on this list is extremely important, or it wouldn't have been on the list. And I, we had a similar conversation when we were making budget cuts for FY17 is that we don't want to make any budget cuts because they all are going to have an impact on students. Um, certainly, we feel similar about this list um, in that all of these have an impact on students. But when we sat down with our administrative team, it was very clear that we needed to put together a list that had um, what we felt was the greatest impact for the school district um, across the board. Um, and so when, and this, uh, so then we came up with this list for the 2.96 million, and I wanna, I wanna go in a little bit of detail. Uh, I have purposely not updated the the document that I passed out to you in July because um, I wanted to wait till the discussion was over tonight before I, I did that. Um, it is a document that I will make available on Thursday night um, for whoever is going to be coming to, to the financial forum. So I'd like to go over each of these areas that we're recommending as part of the $2,960,000 um, and the rationale behind it. Um, so first of all, the structural deficit. I do want to spend just a couple of minutes to talk about the structural deficit um, because we've been talking about it, we've been talking about it, um, but what we haven't talked about is the impact if, we, if the structural deficit mm -hmm. is not addressed. Um, and I think that this is the important part of the discussion is that I, I showed a slide um, a few meetings back that because we have been making cuts over the last three, four years, um, the expense portion of our budget would not, we would, would not be able to take the majority of the $2 million hit. That there is not a lot of non-personnel um, areas that we can cut because a lot of what are non-personnel at this point are things that are required or um, mandated. And I, I mentioned special education at the time, tuition, transportation. Those are things that we have to do. Um, and those are expenses. So we probably could get out of the, the $2 million, about $300,000 in expenses if we, if we needed to make reductions of um, non-personnel, which would, could include technology for a year. Professional development could get reduced. Our per pupil could get reduced. Um, some of those are one-year re reductions. Um, as a short-term gap measure, um, but the majority of the $2 million would be staffing. Um, we have not had any discussions as a district leadership team yet of what that staffing could be. Um, last year, or currently in FY17, as you know, we had to cut 7.3 positions. The majority of that was classroom teachers, um, high school, elementary, and middle, uh, middle school. Um, the next, if, if we had to somehow um, make reductions of $2 million, um, if the override did not pass, essentially what you're looking at is a combination of teachers, support staff, and administrators um, across, across the board. And those are discussions that we would begin having after October 18th, if, it, if that came to be. So I. I I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the $2 million is a real number. It's an extremely important piece of, of, this, of this override discussion. Um, any questions on that, on that piece? I, I, just a comment. It actually harkens back to what Mrs. Webb recommended earlier about finding some way to communicate. We've talked in the past about having to protect morale and start going too far down the road of if right. we have to make massive cuts. What's that going to look like? Because we have teachers starting on Wednesday, and we don't want right. to create that environment at the beginning, and yet we need to be transparent. Um, it would be good if we could find a way to communicate what the approximately 30 FTE cuts would look like in terms of class sizes. Even if you just took K through 2 average class size divided by FTEs, 
reduce it by a certain number. You're not communi communicating which schools, which grade level, but you are giving some flavor of what it will do to class sizes at the elementary level. And then, you know, how you do that at the, the middle and high school. But it's some, finding some way to make people understand that that will impact class sizes and choices at the middle and high school. Yeah, at, the, at the elementary, it, it, would, it would be more of a class size mm -hmm. increase. At the middle school, you're talking about program mm -hmm. cuts yep. um, because of the team model. Um, so you're talking about cutting courses. Um, and at the high school, you're talking about cutting programs and courses as well. Um, so there could be loss, less choice. Um, there could be higher class sizes as a result of less choice because you have less sections. Um, you could have things that are offered right now that are no longer offered, um, which certainly has a ripple effect for students, uh, for college, and things like that. Um, so I, I think those, yes, I, I understand. I, we, again, as you said, we have to be careful because right. Um, even a one, even a one-page PowerPoint slide, just articulating what you just said. Yeah. At the elementary level, this will mean increased class sizes. At the middle and high school level, it will mean program cuts. Even if that's as much as you say to put it on one slide, that clearly articulates that. I think could be helpful. Comment. Mr. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Dr. Darty about not getting in too much depth because yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned it too, Jean, about the teach morale impact. You've been around long enough. Yeah. I've been. We've seen those. What happens used to be put out like at the end of the school year. These are the cuts we're going to make next year if we don't get an override or funded to the state. And t teach them around goes right down the drain, and we don't want to do that. I, I just want to say I completely support that. On the other hand, if we don't get information that people can understand what it's going to mean to them and their their children, then we're sort of stopping the battle before we started because you know we need we need to the idea is that we get this funding to support the things we need for this school district right so you know I, I don't it's just it's the it's the thing that we all, all know it anyone who's been on this board for any length of time or in the past knows that when these start to creep up that's when we get a room full not 20 dedicated people we get you know a hundred people because that's the thing so I think we have to balance yeah we don't want to start a morale and you know an unintended you know morale slide but we have to be as as factual as we can get our hands around and I, I think that means you know here's the set of guidelines we have now this is what they would look like if we don't get the funding that we need and no so, I understand what you're saying that really is only one-third of the picture though Right, because because you're talking about elementary, but there are other right, but I, I two think levels that there okay. will be other impacts other than class size. Right, I think though that you know you can go back to uh, you know what this looked like 13 years ago too, and say, well, this is the data. Now it's right. uh, interesting when you compare the amount of money that we were looking for then, and you know what did that equate to now? Um, so I. I, I don't know if we know if we can say like it will be as bad as that or not. I don't know that yet, but um, I, I think we're, you know, we, we could be in that range, and it's and um, that was not anything that any of us who lived through it wanted to live through again. So I, I think I, I agree. So it's very right summary. It has to be balanced as summary as possible, but as detailed as possible so people can own it and understand it. Yeah. I just wanted to add, too, I mean, I, I agree with both points, but also that we're talking about a, a month. Yeah. Um, and I think our, our staff can handle the reality of, of the information and debate that is going on. Um, I would be more concerned about morale after post October because yeah. then it's a long year um, well, I think I would yeah. disagree with you respectfully that I've been through it and seen what happens and uh, we do not want to start so I contend we don't want to start that at the beginning of the school year um, I think we want to get up to a smooth start you guys have made a great effort to make sure that you know we are going to do it from everything I've heard about today's meeting but I can tell you that if um, if that comes about then there will be staff, there's already staff morale issues, we know that, they'll be, they'll be heightened 
That's yeah. my opinion, having been there and seen it and have it happen to, to my, my colleagues and myself. I think it's a valid point. There's a question. Um, sure. And are you limiting it? I just just to keep us organized. I'm just on the structural deficit. Just the two million dollar structural deficit. Great. Go right ahead. small points out to people who are most affected by this. And my experience in the last few years has been that it is the elementary parents who come out in the fullest of force. And so if one of the goals is to get people coming out and voting, a short piece of information about how this will affect you directly, I think would be quite powerful. So I just want to add that. You know, the 30 FTEs isn't a hard and fast number. That was that was calculated just by saying $2 million divided by the average teacher's 1. salary. 1.6, yeah, the one point, <coughs> I took 1.6. Sorry, 1.6, because yeah. not the expenses. But it, it really is a rough estimate. So I don't know why you couldn't take that a step further and say, okay, let's assume it's 10 at the elementary, 10 at the middle, 10 at the high school. What does that look like? I mean, there's probably a way we could create that very high level. And what you're trying to get across is a scope. It isn't a promise that it's going to be exactly 30 or it's going to exactly look like this, but it is trying to communicate the scope of the problem. So I think that's the takeaway from tonight. Yeah, Mrs. Downing. Just a very quick comment. This may be more appropriate for the town manager. Is there a fallback position? If seven and a half million doesn't pass, that we could have another election with the lower, it was done in Groton and Dunstable in May and June of this year. They had an override in May, it failed both towns, they cut it in half, and they had another vote in June. It Unfortunately, it's a joint school system, and it passed in Dunstable and failed in Groton, and they're dealing with that. But why wouldn't we at least have that on the table? Because I think the sense in town is, a lot of people believe in the structural, the structural deficit. They know it's not the town's fault. They know it's health care and things. And the next part of this meeting will be educating them about why the rest of this is important. And I know I'm going to try to do my part. I, I'm on social media, and I, I support what I see here. But we really should have, what, not putting it on the ballot, but we should have it in mind. It could happen. There's a presidential election. It could happen if we wanted it to. I would tend to pass. agree with you that that is completely a question, and not really for the town manager, for the board of selectmen. Board of selectmen. Yep. Um, you know, everything to do with a, a, just by state law that falls to them. So I, I think I would point you to them. To ask. I well, would I'll certainly not want to It's a valid question. It's, it it's is a, a valid It's a very yeah. valid question, but I wouldn't presume to speak for them. But look, <laughs> we have Mr. Oh, Berman oh, from the board of selectmen. I, I know, I didn't see you come in. Chairs, although you could turn the heat on. It's <laughs> thank you, thank you for turning the air conditioning Just off. really quickly, I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, no. But I, I do want to respond to that question. The board hasn't formally looked at what would happen after. I've had some conversations with the manager, and it is our anticipation that the next time we would do an override, if this fails, is next year. Yeah. So I think it's important that people who care about this stuff, um, you know, need to, to kind of get the word out. I'm not saying that, that we wouldn't look at it in a different way. But um, in my conversations with the manager, um, the next time this will come up would be next year. So. Can, can I just yes, ask? I believe that was the case the last time. It failed, and then we had a year of the CARE campaign. Yeah. So I, I, I think if you look at what's the history of the town, too, if there's a, uh, the override failure, nothing was put back on right away. It was, okay, we got to go back, and it took a year. So I, from my perspective, when I look at this, I'm thinking if this doesn't happen, I'm thinking a year because that's sort of that, that it wouldn't be till next year because that's the history of this community and there's been no dialogue. So I appreciate that. Well, while I'm still standing here freezing, um, <laughs> uh, just, you know, point two, just, you know, as a taxpayer, not necessarily as your board of select. Um, I think it, in my conversations with lots of people as this has come up, I think it really is important for people to know not only what are the things that uh, you know we're going to gain, you know, by doing the override? But what are the potential things that we can lose? We've done a ton of these listening sessions. People love the services that they have in town. Um, you know, I think in three listening sessions with you know well over a hundred people attending, you know, when the question was asked, you know, what are you willing to give up? One person in one of the listening sessions raised his hand and said, "Well, you can plow my street. You you can pave my street last." You know, but other than that, everyone loves their schools. They love the police, they love fire, they love the library. So, you know, people say, well, we don't necessarily want to give something up, um, but they want to know, you know, what, you know, what are the implications of voting yes? 
What are the implications of voting no? What are we going to lose? And I know on the town side, it's a little bit easier. You know, for, you know, for us, we'll survive a little bit next year, but the year after that will be a disaster. What does it mean? We're going to have to lay off cops, firefighters, DPW workers, and the library will be, the brand new beautiful library that we just built will be open less out. I mean, it, it, our, ours is easier to figure out. Your stuff is a little bit more complicated because there's so many moving pieces. But I think it really is important to, you know, you know, try to balance the sort of, you know, not wanting to have teachers looking at each other and go, who's going to be next? But also to cut people to say, what are the potential things that we can lose? So they can make, you know, they go into the ballot box and they can just wait, okay, what do, you know, what am I willing to pay for and, you know, what do I need? And I think part of that equation is, you know, what it might look like if this thing doesn't pass. So that, I would just encourage you not as a member of the board, but as a taxpayer, that that's an important piece of information that people are going to need. Yeah, I think that's really valid. I think if you think of it, we're, we're, in a, we're in a place of greater clarity than we have been since your board voted. Now we really have, there's two options after October 18th. There's, there's a no vote and nothing happens, and that's what this looks like. Or there's a yes vote, and that's what this looks like. And this is the cost for between those. So there's a lot more clarity now around it. But I think communicating it that way is wise. I think that there are specifics too that can be talked about without necessarily saying exactly how many teachers will be cut or what exactly the, the size class will be. When classes get bigger, things fall out. There are programs that we don't have anymore. There was creative writing in our, his, in our high school programs that just couldn't happen for years because there, weren't, there were too many students in a class for a teacher to keep up with reading the journals. There are specifics that teachers can't do when the classes get higher. And so I don't know if that's something that could be captured that w people would be able to relate to. It goes back to what Elaine, what Ms. Webb was saying in terms of where we were before, where we don't want to go again. Um, maybe some of those specifics can be documented so that people know that and the deliverables and the, the losses. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else on the structural deficit number? All right, thank uh, you. The, the, one, I, the one thing I, I do want to add is the, um, the structural deficit does include um, the, uh, the year two yep. for science funding. Mm -hmm. So that's already built in there. Um, this year is year one, FY18 would be year two, FY19 would be year three. So the assumption would be if the override passed that the science curriculum money would continue. It's already built into that structural deficit. So year two and three. Well, year two and then assuming, yeah, you would then continue with year three. Um, the other piece that, that $2 million has, is a result of a budget that would be, if we were to do everything this year, again next year with the normal increases that we have had in you know colas special mm -hmm. education um, uh, bus transportation all of those things we assumed a similar increase than we have been having so that's that's that was the assumption that we made so then just a quick question if the override does not pass what happens to this new science curriculum that's one of the things we're going to have to have a conversation about we did when we presented that. That was not initially part of our operating budget. Right. It was originally right. approved through FinCom right. with a very explicit understanding right. that, that that additional 150 year two and three was expected to come from free cash. And of course that you know Right. And so if in, in the event of a no vote, everything will be back on the table. Right. That wasn't originally part of the operating budget. So that's, okay. right. so that's a good point. That would be highlight. part of the discussion. Right. We, would, right. we would be negotiating again with yep. FinCom for free cash for to year continue two, that. For year right. three. And the good news about a curriculum is that it is a one-time expense. It right. isn't something you pay for again and again. Correct. And right. the community was well informed about the cost of this over three years. So. Anything? Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. So moving to the next piece, the salary adjustment. So, um, you know, this is a, an item that has been there for, for our entire conversations. You've heard me talk about uh, retaining and attracting staff um, on numerous occasions. I can give you anecdotal information from this summer. Um, 
and from previous years on how um, we have had situations where we have offered a position. Um, I wish I had the principals here because they can tell it to you more eloquently, but we've had, um, we've offered positions to candidates this year, this summer, um, and they have declined to go to another school district for more money or better benefits, um, health benefits uh, in terms of the, the contribution that the employee makes versus um, other communities. So um, that is real. That has happened. That is anecdotal. Um, it's not measurable by data, but those are things that have happened. I can also give you situations this summer where we have had a, a handful, not it's not widespread, but a handful of, of teachers leave the district that have been in our district to go to other districts to get sizable salary increases. Um, one comes to mind um, where the, the teacher left uh, to go to um, another school district for a $9,000 raise. Wow. Um, same job, same um, steps, columns, you know, educational, um, and you know, that you can't compete with that. You, you cannot compete with that, and it's usually the high profile positions, um, special education, or foreign language, or um, a school psychologist, social worker, those, those critical positions um, that you know everyone is looking for right now um, and we still have a few openings um, at the high school in the, in those areas that we have not filled for the first day of school that's real that's a real situation that's happening right now um, we we have done an analysis um, as I've mentioned in the past and I don't want to go into too much detail because that certainly would start going into the realm of collective bargaining but we have from the 30 comparable communities we got from each community their salary schedules and we analyzed them with Reading salary schedules um, and it is evident from their salary schedules compared to Reading salary schedules that um, the Reading teachers are in the bottom half of that 30 um, you know again and, it, and we're seeing it with the anecdotal information so um, that number is there for, for retaining and attracting staff. Um, I don't know if you have any qu other questions on that. I just, I have a question. Every time I go into the superintendent's office, the, there is the bulletin board there with the posted jobs. Yes, yes. And I've come in the summer and there are so many jobs posted there. So it seems like a physical manifestation of people not taking those jobs not the right people not applying or not well the summer is always when all your hiring is done and we do have we also have a lot of paraeducator positions open right now so that you're probably seeing a lot of those so well. that's not a reflection of people not grabbing up jobs in a great schools district I mean because of the lack of no that's normal money. you're seeing a lot of open positions in a lot of school districts that's what I did. The pieces have of paper baseline. you're seeing are probably there's are a lot of open paraeducator positions right now. So that's I think what most of our openings are. We do have some teacher positions still open, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> okay. Um, curriculum supervision leadership, I I mean Mr. Martin was talking earlier about the curriculum maps and the coordination and um, that certainly would be one role of the curriculum coordinators. The other role, which I believe is as equally as critical, is the supervision and evaluation piece. Mm -hmm. And I have showed you data in the past of the number of staff that our principals and assistant principals are supervising. Um, and in some buildings, our elementary schools in particular, it's, you know, it's 40 to 50 staff that they're supervising. And, you know, it, I, just to, I think if you went into the business world and saw a ratio like that, I think it, people would say that this is not possible. Um, when you move it to the school setting, um, you know, there are certain, there are certain uh, things that we take pride in when we're using our evaluation process. And what we try to avoid is making it a, um, a checklist and um, a compliance issue. And it's important that that our supervisors are giving feedback, real feedback, timely feedback to our teachers and our other staff so that they can continue to improve. And when you have a, such a high ratio as that, 
it, it can't happen. It's physically impossible for a building principal to do all the other things they need to do each day and supervise staff effectively. So these two positions would support um, primarily our elementary principals in the super value, supervision evaluation piece, but provide the curriculum coordination pre-K to eight. Um, so they, they are critical. If teachers are getting good feedback, that is gonna affect student learning. Um, and that is the important point here. They, this will have an impact on kids. We, we um, as you know, a couple of our principals um, had backgrounds in, strong backgrounds in curriculum. Um, and numerous conversations we've had with them this summer, they have uh, raved about the value of having these positions in the district that they came from and the impact that they have. Um, a lot of school districts have these positions. Um, so it, from the original list, you remember there were three of these positions. I reduced it to two, uh, given, again, because the, the, the fiscal constraint that, that, we, were, that we were under. Um, what these would be, one would be for STEM and one would be for literacy, um, is how we would break it down. Dr. Doherty, I have a question about these two positions. So it sounds like they have sort of two spheres of obligations. And how, I don't exactly know how it would Thank run, you. almost a percentage basis, how much of their time would you anticipate would be spent supporting the principals in evaluating teachers and how much time on the curriculum piece? Um, because that's the piece that I care an awful lot about is that you know second grade math at this elementary school looks pretty much like second grade mm. math at this in between the two high school, uh, sorry, the two middle schools, um, making sure that that alignment and equity is there. So how, how will you make sure that they don't just become evaluators or don't just become curriculum, curriculum supervision, right. you know? How, how do you anticipate balancing that? Because it seems like an awful lot It looks work. like Gary wants to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Having done that job, um, <laughs> previous with, with a evaluation system that was, you know, much less complex, and you only had a, every other year see everybody twice, I mean, teachers are, administrators are, are expected to go in and do how many um, walkthroughs? Is it three to five? What do you? Every, if every it's school? a new teacher, it's it's four. Four. Yeah. It's and four. Every, but every school has its own. What do we have? Two, or I forget what it is. Yeah. Uh, for other teachers, it's yeah two. Yeah. So so the expectation is, to, you know, to get into the classroom, see what's happening, and then do um, almost really like you know a meeting in the beginning of the year to talk about goals, mm -hmm. and then a check in in the middle of the year, and then you know follow up at the end of the year to see what's, a, so I'd say, you know, that when I did it, it was almost like 50-50. I would say, you know, we'd be lucky if we could do it at 50-50, but, um, you know, it's gonna be a balance that has to be made, I think, by Craig and, and John, so it's gonna be tough. You're right, that's a good point. Did you find that the, the school year helped you manage that? I almost feel like when school is in session, you probably do a little more of the evaluation, but during school vacations and over the summer, you do more of the curriculum work. Yeah, but I'll tell you, did you want yeah, to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I sort of envision a 50-50, but I just want to make clear that, it, I mean, I think it looks a little bit differently sometimes than people imagine. I mean, um, Gary, you mentioned it yourself. That's, it's not just a, an observation or a write-up, but for instance, to start off the year by saying, um, you know, here is the, the the way our curriculum is arranged vertically. Here's the shift that's happening in the in the standards. Here is what our, we're focusing on as a district, and this is how it can play out when you're meeting, for instance, with teachers who are working on their individual goals, um, and then say, okay, we're aligned now. Here are the goals that we're going to be working on. As I come into your classrooms, as the principals come into the classroom, we're going to see that you're making progress in this area. So it really is about you know, not just this sort of evaluative part, but that ongoing support um, and conversation throughout the year, and that you have the people that are sort of using the work coordinating that and their expertise in those areas to inform the staff in that. So it's not just I'm gonna come in and see you, but I'm helping you on the front end see where we're going and we're having those conversations together. Um, and I think the districts that have that have seen that that's really invaluable. Mm -hmm. yeah. To go back to what the doctor did, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Dr. Knight. Um, I think I had 25, 28 uh, staff members that I had to supervise. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it was spread out, and, and principals would have a comparable amount. But 
it, you know, I've been a supporter of this partic these particular positions from the beginning. I think the first time I was on the committee, I met with Dr. Doherty and talked about the significance of them and how valuable they were when I was uh, in that role. And sorry, uh, not just in my position, but other positions that are similar. Um, you know, I think, you know, it, it's it's going to definitely improve teaching and learning in, in terms of being able to give that feedback to the faculty that really, you know, they're looking for it. They want it. Mm -hmm. They do want and, it. And, um, you know, and it's got to be valid feedback. It can't be just like, uh, okay, good job, keep it up. You know, it's got to be, you know, input that's going to be used going forward. This is so, um, Dr. Jardy, so one of the important pieces of this discussion um, was around the high school, I believe, and there's been many, many meetings over the years, I think, focusing on certain areas where this was important. So, um, I just now that we're focusing on the pre-K to eight, mm -hmm. and so there's no resource on on the high school. That was something that we really felt. I think I I know I feel really strongly that we needed to do that, but it doesn't look like unless there's fifteen thousand dollars there. We we feel that that's a discussion we can continue to have, but it may not be resource dependent. Okay. I don't think it's resource dependent. It can happen. Yeah. Dr. Doctor. I was just going to say, sticking um, a little bit to the idea of having concrete risk points that we want to document in terms of the evaluation process and our lack of ability to follow through because our administration is too overloaded. I think that, as Dr. Nyan was saying, when there isn't a con the continuity, the opportunity to learn is lost. The teachers are invested in it both because they want to learn, this is why they're here, but also because by mandate they have to put a lot of effort into preparing for their evaluations. They write down their goals, they collect their paperwork, they file. They, they invest a lot of time that is above and beyond what they're spending with their students. Um, and when that's unrequited, then I think that takes morale down, and that's one of the problems that we're having with, with our staff that we're talking about. We don't want to take the morale down. We don't want them to feel at risk, and yet this takes their morale down. Um, there's another point, but I just lost it. It'll come <laughs> back. It'll come back. Um, just a quick point, given this discussion and, and all of the information from a credible source here. Um, <laughs> It really so sounds to me, that, <clears throat> in my opinion, this won't be a 50-50 split. They, in order for them to, in order for these positions to be effective with the supervision um, of the or the evaluation process, I think these two positions would be spending more time there than they would be on the actual curriculum leadership. That's just based on any, everything I've heard. Well, I. I yeah, well, I, I, don't, I, don't I guess my point is that we'd have to more clearly define on what side of the 50. You know, so if I'm sitting and um, having a conversation with the principal or or teachers about goals and the direction for the year, is that supervision and evaluation? Is that curriculum? I could say it's both. It's actually both because I've outlined the curriculum. We we've done you know what whatever. Pacing, guy, with all of that sort of stuff, and I'm making sure that people really understand that, and it's aligning with their with their goals and action steps for the year. Um, and without sometimes those positions, it's very difficult that as mm -hmm. as we embark on the year, that people are fully informed. I mean, sometimes we, you know, we, we kind of have this dichotomy of you know an administrative position versus teaching positions, and uh, these types of positions, I think, when implemented properly these are support for teachers I think teachers are hungry for this sort of guidance and information it's not because people don't want to you know fully embrace the you know instructional practices and that that's talked about in the in the some of the new state standards and things but it's just it's a lot oh, no, you know, I it's agree a lot that's with, happening at I, once agree and with the 100%. To I think that. this is very very important all yeah. I'm saying is is that the 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 mapping and the pacing guides yeah. I just I think that would be secondary, but I, I, I yeah. agree that this is very important. Yeah. It will help the teachers and, and ev the entire community in, 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 in a great way. I just I don't think this is going to help the pacing guides and the maps. 
I will sure. say that I think that with the PLCs in place, I mean, mm -hmm. that's where I was able to do a lot of curriculum work with the Absolutely. PLCs, which was um, pulling the, everybody together from, you know, that particular curriculum area. and. Uh, that's why yeah. getting these structures in place the last two years has been really yeah, important. Definitely helpful. I mean, if you think of it like during the school day, I would say the, the people are in the buildings and in, in classrooms. Right. A lot of type of curriculum work isn't dependent upon those hours of the day. Right. It's it's when school's not in session. It's other things in terms of getting things aligned. But you would be, yeah. you could be in that classroom observing and making sure that they are on the curriculum. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But, that was right, it. It's Yes. That was the second point that I wanted to say, that the other role that the evaluation plays is, and, and having people that are helping to do it, is to enable people to work towards their goal, and when they're not reaching their goals, to have documented that process, mm -hmm. so that at the end of that process, there aren't surprises. Mm -hmm. Because when there are surprises also, that knocks the morale, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm focusing mm -hmm. on that morale, it, it knocks it down, you know, but, but we never had our second evaluation or mm -hmm. that, that 10 minutes was our second evaluation, but I didn't get to ask X, Y, and Z. So mm -hmm. without the time that's spent on that, and I agree that some of it is serving both purposes. It's both working with the curriculum and supporting the teachers towards their goals. But when there were surprises yeah. at the end of the year because people didn't get that time with their administrator that knocks the morale down as well right, right. and that's well, concrete plus your time in the classroom or conversations with teachers are informing your strategies or action steps for professional development for focus you know priority focus areas in the curriculum for the year ahead you can't really do that well without that so it's I see it like as a loop that's constantly informing all right Let's keep okay. going yes so move on to the next piece which is the additional supports for struggling students. Um, the change that was made here uh, from the, the original list is that we have reduced the board certified behavior analyst from 1.0 to 0.5. Our thinking behind this is that um, we currently use some consulting services um, in this area and some other areas and through restructuring we could use restructured funds from the consulting services to get the other 0.5. Um, Carolyn has some ideas on how we can better effectively use some of the consulting services we have, um, and that's that would be something that we could do to get it back to 1.0. Um, I, you know, this this fits right in the line with uh, our tier two supports that we've been discussing. Um, at the middle school and high school, we do not have any regular education academic support um, so this, the, uh, the academic tutors would be focused primarily at the middle and high school. The board certified behavior analysts would be focused at the elementary. Because um, that's where these services are currently lacking. Um, so we do feel that this is an important, um, the, I mean they're all important, but this is, that's the rationale behind. The, um, the BCBA. Uh, my understanding is our current BCBA, which was added to the budget very, very recently, is predominantly focused on special education students? Just on certain programs, actually. Even We've narrowed more, the focus even, even more. To make it a manageable case. Would this position also be targeted to special education or conceivably out into the general ed population? It's to look at the general education population, to look at our tier two, they may do yeah. some of our functional behavioral assessments for either a general education or a special education mm -hmm. student. I think that's tremendous. So. I think that's one of the great strengths of MTSS is having a tier two that that doesn't create two classes of students where you're either in this population or in this, but you know, you might be a general ed student that's really struggling in a particular area and having some support for those mm -hmm. kids and not having to have the parents advocate yeah, for an IP mm -hmm. to get those supports. So I, think that's great. I also think it's building the capacity of our staff. So yep. having a BCBA, an additional BCBA on staff helps our teaching staff develop strategies they can use in the classroom. Yep. So it's not just that person dependent, it is building capacity. Right. Here's some ways you can improve behavior in your classroom setting. And that's a lot of what a BCBA can help our teachers with. I think also that relates to the discussion at the, with Selectman too in terms of making an initial investment that saves money in the long run. Yep. Because if we have that tier two 
those kids aren't necessarily going to need the tier three supports. Mm -hmm. Or special education. More, or special right. education that are much more costly. Yep. Right, and that, that, was, that was certainly in the rationale and part of the reason that these were needs. Absolutely. Dr. Nye. Um, so two things on that. Um, one, I, I can just say that from my experience, um, I'm not saying don't do it. It's better than nothing, but a .5, um, you're most looking at someone's going to be transient. They, they get an opportunity to take a job somewhere else, and they could be gone in the middle of the year. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's better than not having the position. The, the intent is to make this 1.0 through restructured consulting. So that's where we're, we're – our hope is to get it to 1.0. So it would be one person, yep. essentially? Yes. Yeah, yes. It would be one person. But only half of the salary would come from the additional correct. override money. Right. Correct. Carolyn believes she can restructure some money right. to fill it in, if, to your exact point, mm -hmm. to make it a one mm -hmm. point. But there are some other 0.5 positions that I've seen, too, that, that I think fall into the category I was describing. The one other thing that, you know, not, not to um, take away from the significance and the importance of having academic tutors at the secondary level, um, I know even listening to um, Sarah Bird, uh, my questioning of her, you know, how are we doing with, you know, tier two students and tier three students? And, you know, it was admitted to us, I believe, that it's a challenge. And with, uh, you know, I think with 4.0 full time academic tutors at the elementary level, we probably would come closer to avoiding having tier two students and tier three students at the secondary level. Um, just my thoughts. There are already academic tutors at the elementary level. Right, but I'm still hearing that it's a challenge, though. No, no, I understand. Um, and, you know, we, we do have students right now that need those supports at the secondary level. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I'm also thinking that, you know, down the road, we'll have less of those at the secondary level if we could put more um, finances into the um, elementary level. I would even say some of the other positions that we've been talking about, even the curriculum alignment, the yeah, coaching, wow. all of that actually, because that strengthens your tier one. I mean, any of the MTSS literature would say, if you're finding you're having too many fires at tier two, it may be because your tier one's not strong enough. So the more you build the capacity in tier one, it's actually helping that mm -hmm. issue as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Dr. Doherty. Uh, so moving on to the next one, the uh, 0.5 assistant director, a similar thought process here um, this will not be a 0.5 position by itself what it's going we, what we will do is we will combine this with either our out of district position which is a 0.5 or uh, one of our schools so the person would be a 0.5 assistant director 0.5 team chair in a building or 0.5 assistant uh, director and 0.5 out of district coordinator um, so again we're trying to maximize what we have, restructure some things. Um, we currently have one point, a point five position, mm -hmm. um, so that would make sense to combine the two. Um, it would still provide some support uh, in the special education department. It would strengthen programs that would allow Carolyn to go in and, and um, do more program coordination um, so that we can focus on keeping our, our students back in the district, um, so it, it still would be able to support the, the original <coughs> goal um, of what we were trying to do. Does that mean that we would be losing point four, I'm sorry, point five of a team chair elsewhere because I've heard how vital those are. No. No, um, we'd just be taking, they would co we would combine a point five team chair and a point five. So they'd essentially go they to point one two, which is more attractive. Yes, it would be a 1.0, so. Thank you. How many I, .5s do we have that are team chairs? Well, we. <laughs> yeah, it, Still. it varies. Yeah, I mean, it, probably the easiest way to put it is we have a .5 out of district mm -hmm. person right now. Yeah. And so th that, that would be the logical combination, mm -hmm. but you could do it with just one school, too. You could say this person's going to. Mm -hmm do one school and then we could have someone else to be out of district. I think the other piece when you talk about the team chairs, the other advantage to having this position is so our team chairs typically don't work in the summer. So when there are concerns that arise in the summer, 
uh, families contact me and unfortunately I can't run all of those meetings or be responsive to all of that but by having someone else who could be an assistant director that's another area we could strengthen our communication with parents being more responsive as one person in the office for those 71 days um, there are a lot of things that do come up over the summer and so again if my you know it's, it's balancing those pieces as we talk about the curriculum leadership are you doing that communication and work with families or are you doing that long-term planning around professional development and looking at strengthening our programs and our curriculum and sometimes you can't do it all and so by having this additional person it would allow for that time whether it's myself working with the families or this person working with the families. Right. Okay. Um, the next piece is the middle school health education. Um, a few years ago, uh, this there was a 1.0 position which was uh, serving both middle schools, uh, which was cut out of the budget. Um, at the time, it was only really offering a quarter of a health education program a quarter of the year to one grade this will certainly expand it at least to two grades semester based courses perhaps more um, again that would be dependent upon um, the scheduling piece availability um, but it would provide one and a half teachers at Parker one teacher at uh, Coolidge uh, Parker is the bigger school so that's why you have the, the disproportion um, and uh, so they would be focused on delivering and, and teaching the, the, the health curriculum um, for, the, for the two schools. Currently, there have been some agreed upon lessons um, that were developed um, this summer that are taught in the physical education classes a few times during, during the year. So there is no formal health education right now at the middle school other than those lessons. Um, so this certainly would put it back to a place where we would, you know, combined with what's happening at the high school, now that we have uh, put in 10 lessons, again, it's not optimum, but that we have 10 lessons in grades three, four, and five at the elementary for this year. Um, it, does, it does begin to put together a health education program. Um, if I can comment, I think that you know, I think personally, well, from my own experience at 2.5, you could get all three grades um, if they did it in a semester type approach. Although we did it, we had trimesters, so it made it a little bit yeah. easier in Danvers, but could be done. And um, I think it's important that all grades have it. Um, I'm hearing a lot from parents um, in the community that are, are interested adults that are concerned about the epidemic we have, not just, you know, in, in Reading, but all over the state, to other states, to the country. Um, the opiate crisis is not getting better. And it, prevention, to me, is, you know, that's, that's going to make the difference. And it's, it's really been um, essentially, um, you know, put, put behind all these other interventions. And, you know, going back to the 4.0 academic tutors, you know, if, if we have prevention, preventive uh, opportunities for our students, um, then, you know, we're less, less likely to have to worry about interventions later on. That said, I'm absolutely going to state we have to have certified health educators. What we've seen, not just in Reading, but I've seen it in Reading, a .5, excuse me, a uh, physical education teacher who's taken the test and but hasn't done all the and passed the test and now has a preliminary license but they haven't done they don't have the course background they don't have the curriculum expertise they don't have the instructional strategies that you would have from an undergraduate degree in health education or a master's degree in health education um, I would be really really disappointed to see that if uh, you know we ended up with those types of candidates um, and I, I think these are positions that have to be um, you have to go out and, and there's not a lot of health educators out there to be perfectly honest but you have to go out and, and find them you have to go to uh, universities colleges that do offer health education as a major and and you know essentially try to try to get them interested in coming to the running public schools um, 
Of course, the other thing I'm going to say is that I, I, I still am very adamant that we have to have an evidence-based curriculum in place. Um, you know, at the elementary level, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that Dr. Darty was able to put 10 lessons in at each grade level starting in grade three. But 10 lessons, um, you know, what, what is a major crisis in, the, in our community right now? And that is the, the opiate crisis. And again, it starts down at those levels. And um, yeah, it would be nice for them to be able to have a couple of lessons on nutrition and a couple on body systems and so forth. But 10 lessons um, doesn't go far. And if you could take 10 lessons and, you know, emphasize or, or you know, place it, you know, include, excuse me, include, but not, you know, have it focus, I'm sorry, on, on prevention and, but in particular, uh, decision making um, and skills based, um, which, you know, that the national standards, there's eight national standards in health education. One is on content, the others are on, on skills. And that's kind of like, um, you know, the old circumstance, whether, you know, when, when we had initially um, MCAS on history, you know, do they want to know dates or they want to know why these, uh, you know, what, why these occurred and how we can prevent them in the future? That's skills-based. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really reluctant to support these positions unless I know that we're going to do that. Um, I don't, you know, we're obligated as school committee members to make sure we spend the money that we are, you know, particularly, you know, potentially given, um, voted, and, and um, you know, we, we need to make sure we're doing the very best we can. And um, those are my points. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ballard. Oh, yeah. Just along those lines, in the $140,000 for the 2.5 FTE, does that also include the curriculum? It's 110. I'm sorry, what did I, what did I say? 100. It's, a, it's so, actually uh, 110 for two. So, oh. um, I'm looking at 140. So it's, I'm looking no, at 140. It's 140. Yeah. It's 140. Oh, sorry. So just wondering, is that just So uh, if I can, I, I want to I try to speak to some of the points, right. and then I, I will, either Craig or I can get to the other thing. So we are, we're always trying to hire licensed educators for the roles that they're supposed to. It's not just health. I mean, it's all subjects. Um, I, I know the situation you're referring to that was a few years ago. Um, but with health, the health teacher you met tonight has been teaching health education and is licensed for, to ten, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. But I can also say that we've had. No, I agree. Really and only, I, but when we are always trying to find a license, I'm not, I'm not educator. saying you're not trying to, but right. I think may, we may have to try harder if we're going to be looking at 2.5 positions. And I, I understand. Point. And that's always our intent is to hire licensed educators for whatever position that we okay. are. I can also talk to situations where I know licensed professionals were not hired over people that have maybe have preliminary licensure over someone who applied that had. Um, you know, uh, professional licensure are. Uh, I think we're going to be careful about getting yeah. into any yeah. personal. Yeah, I, it's always our intent to hire licensed educators yep. for any teaching position, any administrative position that is. Um, and when we are not able to, then we hire the best candidate available. Um, in in terms of the curriculum, a curriculum was purchased through an extensive process with our teachers. Um, when we had health in the middle schools in 2013. We still have that curriculum. Oh, okay, so you just It go still back to exists. That one. Okay. Um, it is a research based curriculum, um, and the difference between research based and evidence based is the amount of time it has been uh, used in classrooms. Um, Can I just, but I have to jump was, in on that. It's not so much about the time I, it's been I was used gonna, in my, classrooms, yeah. but it's more about the impact it's had on student behavior. Over a 10-year period, it's been looked upon and studied and said, okay, this has changed behavior. And also, it doesn't just change behavior for a temporary point in time. It has duration up to like 12 years for an evidence-based curriculum, to, for a curriculum to be called or categorized as evidence-based. So an entire process was used at the time um, and leading up uh, to the selection. Um, to, to choose that curriculum. And they did look at evidence-based, they looked at research-based, um, and that's what they came up with, was the, 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 the curriculum at that. Now, the curriculum is, to, is used for the, 
the lessons that are taught now, um, but it's you know certainly not being used to the full extent. And it's still being taught in phys ed classes. Uh, it, just some sporadic lessons, you know. As I, right. yeah. I mean, even that, I so there's some agreed upon lessons yeah. in both schools for this year that are going to be taught during uh, physical education classes. Right. And this, I mean, that in and of itself, I think, is really problematic. I it is. Oh, it's solve, absolutely yeah, problematic. This would solve that. There'd be a absolutely. Health class uh, there's, for health there's educator everything. Doesn't every, pull kids out of PE where we, they want to. We are play. not happy with where we are right yep. now with health education. I've never said we are. Yep. Um, we are the reason why this is on this list is for that very reason um, I made a commitment two years ago to this committee that I was going to do everything I could to get health education started back in the grades we did that this year in grades three four and five it's ten lessons I know it's not um, sufficient I, I wish we could do more um, but with the resources that we have available they have chosen ten lessons that they feel are appropriate and important for students at that grade we're doing the same in, in, um, in the middle school right now. We want to expand that. That's why it's up here. Mrs. Yeah, I, I think the point is we, you know, we're trying to go through this list and we have very limited funds. So there's 140,000 then that I apologize that is allocated. And the, it, it's, a, it's a start. So you know, maybe we don't have the money for, to, to do a different curriculum. If we get this, we're going to be extremely fortunate. I think we need to, to you know, start from where we are. And then you know, maybe it, we'll have an opportunity to do a curriculum, you know, a reevaluation in a couple of years, and look at what's out there and say, you know what, there's evidence-based programs that are now much better and a much better fit for our district. And, but I think the, the point is, you know, the, we, we need to get started with this. We need to, I, I, I would hope that um, the 140,000 would cover the ability, I question that, to get, you know, certified health educators. It seems, um, you know, these people that we saw, all the teachers we saw here today, you know, probably have more degrees than a lot of us, maybe not you guys, but um, so I, I think that, you know, we have to, take this we got to keep going down this list because there's a lot of things that didn't make the list and we haven't even started talking about those yeah yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Dr. Doherty. so you want to keep continue? going yeah. um, and then the last item on this list um, is the high school piece um, originally we had four FTEs on this list we we did cut it down to two um, this essentially is what was reduced this year uh, when it came to the actual uh, sections minus the freshman advisory. Um, that doesn't mean that what was cut would get restored. It means that it is two teachers that we will be able to use to improve the programming um, at the high school, increase um, elective and AP course offerings. It's not as much as we could do with four, but it still, it still will be able to make a difference. Um, I know that the high school is spending this year taking a look at their schedule. Um, they made some change. You heard Mr. Barker talk about some of the changes that they made for this year with, uh, with intervention blocks, things like that. Um, they're going to continue to look at that for next year. This will help with that um, and certainly will, will lead to a change in graduation requirements as well at some point that they would be coming to the committee for, to do. Yeah, I just, I just want to say that that I understand that this is where we end up on this, but I think that, you know, that I think that we saw an impact personally in acceptances and that we could have had some of our students doing better had they had opportunities to enrich their overall um, profile and their, their overall portfolio of saying, look at this is what I did at Reading High. Yeah. And I'm, you know, uh, overall, I'm just, it's, it's frustrating the stuff that's not the stuff that we have to talk about now is it it hurts all of us but I just think that you know it's the budget you go budget from year to year and you know we put things off and we put things off and we put things off but kids keep going through every grade every year they don't get that and this is not you this is us this no, is no, like I, this is uh, my this is uh, this is the responsibility that I took on as a school committee member and this is where it becomes really painful and very 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 difficult and so you know the two resources 
is certainly better than none. If, this, if the number had been seven million, we would be talking about none and it would have been a lot harder. So I'm thankful that we've got the two. But. So I think, um, you know, to, you, to your point, I, I think it's a combination of different, is, if we can't have the four, then what else can we be looking at? And I think it's a combination of additional staffing plus how and when are these courses sequenced. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. We, Craig and I were having a conversation with uh, Trace Gein, the math department head, and Adam the other day. And, you know, Lexington has a model where kids don't take honors and AP. They take AP as their honors class. Mm -hmm. So they may take in, in their sophomore year biology, they take it as AP biology. They don't take honors biology mm -hmm. first. You know, and, you know, Lexington, that's how they, they do their sequence. So they have the opportunity to take more AP courses over time because of that one structural change. They're getting the curriculum, they're getting an AP curriculum um, in lieu of the honors, but they're still getting challenged in, in that area. So that's, that's one example. I think we need, it's a combination of staffing and looking to do things differently. Mm -hmm. And I know that Adam is doing that. He's looking at different models that exist out there and how can we look at things differently. And that's, that's just one small mm -hmm. example, but um, so I agree. I, and believe me, the four is what is is you know optimum. But I think the two represents also what was cut that didn't include the um, the advisory. Right, and I agree that that's like you know people can identify with that as well. That was the the need. That was what was lost. But for for goodness sakes, no, this was the need. Right. The need was for, and there's a cost to not doing that. But it, and I completely appreciate the creative, you know, everybody here is always, you know, trying to, how can you be creative with that? And, you know, I, I know the strategies that get kids directly to AP, most of those kids also do a little tutoring and summer work before they go directly to an AP right. class. But, and if they're motivated, they'll do that. Um, and, and, and maybe we can offer that. So that's a good um, scenario. But now for the rest. Yeah. So, um, um, so you want me to move forward? Yeah. Exactly. So this is the part of the list that, um, or the original list that was not included, and, um, and you know some of these I've already. So I, I think this will go a little bit quicker. Um, you know I already mentioned the point five board certified behavior analyst, and the two teachers at the high school, um, and the additional uh, curriculum leadership, and the special education leadership. I think the big item that um, well, one of the big items that's on this list, on this list and on the other list, is the Wednesday piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, we, we all struggled with this conversation, but we needed to look at everything as a total integrated package, what would benefit the entire district. Um, if you have that much of the funds uh, available, uh, dedicated towards that one area, it would not allow us to do some of the other things we talked about on the other list. Um, and it would, it would actually limit a lot of the things that, so we feel that um, this is something we certainly feel we need to do, but right now we just can't make that financial commitment. It's very similar to full day kindergarten, I think. Mm -hmm. You use a similar, that full day kindergarten and this are very important, but right now we just don't have the financial resources to make that big of a of a commitment, um, that's that's available. Good question. I know we have extended day. Do we have an extended day that covers that's available for parents who are really truly struggling with the Wednesday afternoons? Yeah. The they do have one. Day. Yeah, they do have extended day for so the there for is the Wednesday like piece. Yeah, a similar model to our tuition based full day kindergarten where parents it's not ideal. It's not. Yeah, there is, there is a Wednesday afternoon piece and connected from with all extended the schools. Day. They can access yep. that. The, well, the elementary schools. Yeah, that's yes. what I mean. Yeah. So I, I think that's an important piece of it, and there's some other things going on that the selectmen have been working on um, with tax policy that sort of relate to that. And um, but I think I've had uh, conversations with um, at least one person who, who contacted us and just sort of had a phone conversation. I think the key is. From an academic perspective, you know, this is, it's important that we 
you know, from an academic perspective, the teacher planning that we move to this. And, but it's, it's just something that it's such a big chunk because you have to do, you can't do a piece of this. You can't do 0.5 no. of this. You have to, you know, do this for the district. And it's such uh, a significant amount of money um, with respect to this sphere and, this, and our, our budget. So I think it's a really important thing for us to do. I have, but I was thinking, I have no idea, you know, how you go about doing that outside the override. That's because that's a big chunk. Uh, so, you know, I, I, what do you give people for down the road? Or we might be able to implement this in a couple of years. I, I don't. I you know, I can't. Yeah, we, we can't, can't make a commitment. That. But, no, we but can't yet make a we'll commitment. probably be the only district if you look. I don't know, three or four years from now. Right, we'll be we'll be like standing on our own with the Wednesday. We're already you know fairly close to that. So I I just want to say I I feel like it's a really important thing for us to do. I can totally, um, I I you know totally empathize and with the the parents who want it. I think it's the right thing for our students, but it's just it's too it's too big a number. It's uh, you know it's eight instead of seven and a half. Um, the school transformation grant funded positions, um, the, the rationale behind not, well, a couple things. First of all, the, the grant still goes for three more years. So FY17, FY18, FY19. Um, at the end of FY19, there would be not funding for these two positions. At the end of FY19, the science curriculum implementation ends. So what the plan would be at this point is that you would then move what was allocated for science curriculum funding to these, the, the funding for the, it, it's not identical amount of money, but it's close. Um, and that this, this would be, if for these positions, um, you would use the funding from the science curriculum piece. The intent would be to continue it and to fund these two positions. Um, but this funding still has three more years. So, um, that would be the intent on those two positions. I would suggest, given that strategy, um, if the board votes to accept that as a plan, that that be moved actually to the other grid. Because we really are saying we do plan on funding these positions. Okay. I, I think, it, just from a communication standpoint, if what we're saying is we will, we will continue with these positions, and here's how we're going to fund it, I, I'd like to put it on the... It has to sort of go in as a zero for right it, now. It does have though, to go in as a zero. Yeah. But the footnote yeah. explains that. Yeah. 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 So can I just? Yeah. So I just want to say that I, this is a one item that I know it was in some of the dialogues easy for maybe some people to look at. You know, you're just talking about a data analyst. It's so, these positions are so valuable. Yeah. And by the time we get to where we're actually, you know, using the, the um, funding for this and, and it's off the grant, they are going to be even more valuable. And, and if we didn't have a plan right now for that, we would be getting to that point going, wow, what are we going to do now? Because we cannot lose these resources. So I think this is really, really important to do um, and, and uh, talk about, you know, sort of the capacity building, really important. So I, I, I you know, support that approach and I think you know, making sure that it's visible to people. Yeah. And I'm really happy to see that. And then the last piece is the clerical support, which unfortunately we, at this point, we don't have yeah. a mechanism. Um, we've been able to do a little bit this, this year because we did have, uh, because of our reduced kindergarten enrollment, we were able to restructure uh, some of those positions to be clerical support for this year. Uh, for our uh, for our special education staff, um, but that would be this is a one year right now, um, and it was based on a lower enrollment that we had um, in the regular ed para uh, area for kindergarten. Um, so that's that's where we're at with the with the list. Well, thank you, Dr. Doherty. I know, um, given the timing of the Board of Selectmen's vote and the upcoming meetings, where we I think need to provide the community with a bit more clarity on what it is that we will or will not be able to include in an overhead amount. I know you had to work really quickly to to get this prioritization done. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to open it up to the committee at this point for discussion, and then certainly I think there might be people here who want to talk to. So. 
Any questions um, from the committee? As we went along. Yeah, yeah we yeah, really did. Yeah, we did. Really? Well, all right, I have to. Yeah, go ahead, Doctor. I Parker. just wanted to say how sad I am about the clerical support because <laughs> I just don't. It's again that investment to not to save money because I don't want the vital, energetic, well experienced and knowledgeable teachers and administrators that we have to burn out because they're wasting their time on copying and filling out forms and making phone calls. And I realize I have to accept it, but I, again, if we're articulating the cost of things, we're paying wages, higher wages for our well-trained people to be copying and filling out forms. And that's valuable time that could be spent on stopping kids from other, needing other services that cost us more money. Mm -hmm. Just had to say that out loud. <laughs> I, um, I would share this. We've heard, we've had a few emails which came to the entire committee. Um, and I've had some private conversations with individuals who've reached out by phone or in one case, on a walk in my neighborhood. <laughs> um, and I will say, I was surprised at the energy around middle school health education. That is something that people have really globbed onto. At least, it's a very small sample size, and ultimately, we're going to have to make a decision. That's what we were elected to do. So we can take in that input, but we have to make the decision that we think is in the best interest of advancing student achievement um, in the district for all kids. But that was interesting to me, that the amount of people who were surprised to learn about the state of health education in this district and very eager to support it. So I'll, I'll share that. Um, and I, to Dr. Darks's point, I, there are actually two items on th this list that I particularly starred. Um, one was the two FTEs at the high school because I share Mrs. Webb's concern about adequately supporting that. And I do think the clerical support, what gets me is it's, it's, this is something where you don't need 2.5, 0.5 helps, 1.0 helps, and it's a relatively small dollar amount. Um, both of those, if we keep them on this list, strike me as areas for potential investment if there is any, if an override passes, there could be potentially good revenue news somewhere down the road. A grant comes up that we weren't expecting. State aid maybe goes a little higher. Maybe some of our conservative investments, heck, maybe it's not a snowy winter and we don't spend as much on snow and ice. Well, no, that's a town budget, actually, we don't take their money. Uh, what's the equivalent? Uh, special, out of, out of, no, special ed, we can't put the general ed. There's gotta be some cost in the general ed budget that can surprise us to the upside. The cost of paper goes down. Um, but there, there can be surprises on the revenue side from the state. Um, and you know, just ten or twenty thousand dollars can be used to support these. So there are there, the full day Wednesdays, no. But there are some things on this list that I think we could maybe make some dents in with a little bit of good news. So that's my optimistic hope on those. Yeah. The challenge, just to be realistic, though, if it's a person, then we need to think about sustainability. Oh, no doubt. So no a windfall doubt. doesn't really give us the sustainability for a person that invests their time and their energy in our district, and then if it's not. No, I'm talking about a revenue, an increase in projected revenues. You're right, not a one time. You're right, absolutely fair point. So I, I, since we do have a representative select in here, I'm just gonna say I think that the, what's really important is to, is to he, be here in this conversation and understanding that there are a lot of assumptions that went into taking the structural numbers and building additional things into that, right, to carry us over and account for um, maybe some of the assumptions and try to account for the timeline. And if those are proved to be very, very conservative, then I think it's really important to be able to, to go back and say, you know, will that present some other opportunities for the schools or the municipality in two years? And I, and I don't know if, you know, that's, I guess I'm hoping that that can become an option, and maybe maybe Barry does want to come. Sure. Yeah. Oh. For a long view, <laughs> member of the board of selectmen, um, we've all gone through this for many many years together, and we know how hard it is when we try to budget one year at a time. Um, this is the time we're trying to budget eight years. So I can tell you with absolute certainty 
that everything in this model is not at the end of eight years is not going to be true. So, right. you know, are we going to have better local aid? Maybe. Um, you know, less snow. Maybe. I mean, there's so many things that, that, that could happen in a, posit I mean, in a positive way. I like to think of it in a positive way. Um, and then a few things could happen. Um, one is that we can um, do a little bit more on, on, uh, on both sides. The other thing is, is that it could potentially um, delay the amount of time that we have to go back and do this again. Mm -hmm. So th there's plenty of opportunity. And also the model that, that, that the manager built, um, you know, I, I want folks to really understand that, th you know, right now you went through a whole lot of things that might not happen and things that you're trying to debate what will happen if, if an override does pass. There's still growth that's built into the budget year after year. So it doesn't mean that if something doesn't get into the budget in year one, it doesn't mean that in year two, as priorities change, that you might not be able, you know, it doesn't mean you can't add it on later. We're building in 3.5% additional revenue each year. Um, and also priorities ch uh, will shift. So, you know, you're not setting, I, I just, I think it's really clear to folks here and, and, and as they think about this is that you're not stating today, 2000. 16, what's going to be in the budget in 2024. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is basically stating what's going to happen next year, right? And then after that, you know, um, could we get a little lucky on some things? Could some costs come down? Um, you know, then you can look at maybe doing a little bit more. So, you know, that's, you know, that, that's the thing. I mean, you know, when you're going out and trying to, when we came up with sort of like how long do we want this to last, yeah. um, you know, we don't want to, if you go out, well, we want this to, we don't want to come back to the community for another 10 years, 15 years. Well, that means that the budget figure we'd have to ask for now would be so huge that it, it wouldn't pass. On the other hand, we could have made the number more palatable, saying, well, you know, instead of seven and a half million, maybe it's four million. But that means that we have to go back to the community in three years and do this again. Does anybody want to do that? I don't, I don't think so. So, you know, the, the amount of years that was selected we try. We try to coincide that with when the debt from uh, the library and the high school will fall down. So this way, those debt exclusions, those people will sort of see a raise. They'll get a raise because their tax bills will come down. So we're hoping to kind of coordinate that with um, the time we have to go to the taxpayers. And the other piece that's also that taking up a lot of our time is um, trying to develop, you know, the few remaining economic development parcels in town. Um, you, you know, I don't know folks saw this, but, you know, Reading, um, we, uh, we have a very, very small percentage of revenue that on, our, on commercial property. We just don't have a lot of commercial property. We're trying, to develop, we're trying to double the amount of stuff that we can do, kind of a Walker's Brook 2, you know, the lack of a better term. Um, and that will create some of the new growth that, again, could add some things in or delay the time that we have to go ask the taxpayers again. So, you know, now that whole you know, that's going to take a lot of bandwidth on the selectments part because, you know, right now we're just, we're working with a finite pie. We're trying at the same time expand that pie a little bit um, in ways other than asking the taxpayers for more. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what's going to be a big part of our plate. So, you know, again, it's, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to create, you're trying to do budget priorities really for FY18. Um, but people shouldn't think that just because something didn't get into the budget this time because we just didn't have enough money. It doesn't mean that it can't get added on later if situations change. So. Thank you so much for being here. No, my, my pleasure. And I think the economic development is a perfect example of what I couldn't come up with because it's so late. Right. Yeah. Um, is a perfect example of, you know, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars may not seem like much in a 43 million dollar budget, but you know yeah. that's the clerical support. Cool. So just a little bit of news to the upside might allow us to do some of the things here yep. that. And Can't the good news is, is you get to do your budget in 19 and 20 yeah. and 21. And, you know. <laughs> Every year. But right now we're trying to figure out what it's going to look like, um, you know, through FY 24, 25. Um, and, and, and that's how you have to build them all. So. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Anything else from the committee on this? Just to follow up on what Gary said. Oh, Mr. Um, Dr. Nine. The, the uh, economic development piece would be, you know, critical oh. and key. And, um, I think I mentioned maybe at one point that uh, a friend of mine was telling me how they now doing full day kindergarten in Linfield, and yep. I said, "How are we doing that? How are you doing that?" And he said, two words: Market Street." Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> I imagine. Yeah. 
anything? I think we're good. Was there anybody here tonight who wanted to speak? Wow. Okay. I think we do have a motion. Okay, we have a motion. Move to approve the FY18 prioritized resources needed to address educational challenges and the structural deficit as presented in the total amount of $2,960,000. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Yeah. In the vague recesses of my mind, I remember the town manager saying something about um, if we designate a list of things that our money is, the override is going to go towards, then we're bound to that. No, well, that's, that's on the actual ballot. Question. It's only if it's on yeah, that that's the ballot. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. No. And that is only in year one. Right, it's but that's, that's on the actual ballot. Question. Okay. This is not tied into your. Balance. So we'll still be able to maneuver you, like the point fives and. If if for if the when if when the uh, override passes in October, don't forget we have to go through an entire FY18 budget process that you vote on at the end of January. Yeah. So. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we were not. No, when, you're not. You're so. not tying yourself. Down. Thank you. Even Dr. Dine. One last effort. <laughs> 20 students that I've had since I started teaching are now dead from opiate overdoses. We have to do the absolute best we can to prevent this from going on. And there's no way, I mean, I have a doctorate in curriculum and instruction, and I'm telling you right now, evidence-based curriculums is the approach that we need to have. If they did it and they came up with a study and they came up with research-based approach, it's flawed, okay? There's no two ways about it. Evidence-based curriculum means that there's been 10 years or more of study proven that it's had positive impact on student behavior. And, as I mentioned earlier, there's a duration factor. So some students that receive uh, uh, an evidence-based curriculum when they're in third grade uh, at the age of eight, 12 years later, 20 years old, where we're seeing a lot of our students, previous students, pass away from opiate, uh, opiate overdoses. You know, there's a duration factor that can prevent that from occurring. <clears throat> Anything else? Are we ready for a vote? We're ready. All those in favor of the motion? 5 0, the motion passes. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion. motion to adjourn. <laughs> second. Second. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you.